something bigger than that. So we are not gonna be able to hold the hearing. Oh, there's Chair McVale, sorry. Hello, Chair. So I'm just letting the commission, the public and our applicants know that we are not gonna be able to conduct this hearing today. We do not have the ability to stream. We are required to do the streaming to still hold our public meetings, even though it's in a um, virtual online um, status. What we can do, and I need to check in with uh, the planners as well and the applicant, we have the ability to continue this full agenda to next Thursday. I do not know, we need to see if we have the commissioners available. That would be, I think it's the 20, is that the 27th? Let me check my calendar, make sure I know our dates here. Um, let me let me get my calendar real quick. Okay, I'm looking at mine and I'm good for next week. Okay. And we would also need to ask our, our applicants for both projects because we want to make sure that they would be available. Uh, Dave, this is Mark Lloyd, I am available. Okay, thank you, Mark. And Mindy and uh, Charles and Thomas, are we all good on the county team? Yes. Okay, thank you. And um, Warren Wegerer and Mr. Robinson, are you available next Thursday? Uh, is... What time? <clears throat> can, can you hear me? This is, this is Bill Robinson. Yes, Mr. Robinson. I think we would be at 8.30 again. Oh, okay, wait. Oh, oh. <laughs> well, hold a second. Okay, Renee, is it really there? Well, hold for another minute here. We, we might pull it together. Just one more moment. All right, everybody, we are live. It is working. Apologies to everyone. So we'll turn it back over to Chair McVale. Okay, call the meeting to order at 9.24 a.m. on January 20th, 2022 for the Ventura County Planning Commission. Secretary Verdusco, would you please call the roll? Chair McPhail? Present. Commissioner Boydston? Here. Commissioner Idukas? Here. Commissioner Garcia? Here. Commissioner King? Here. Okay, would you all please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? Ready? I pledge allegiance. To the United States, States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one, one nation good. under God, yeah. indivisible, Indiv with liberty and justice for all.
Okay, before we go to item four, Secretary Verdusco, uh, would you please put up on the screen where people can uh, text for comments? Renee, you're on mute. Are you able to bring up the screen? Yes, sorry, I'm pulling up the file. Okay, can everybody see the my screen? Okay, welcome to the January 20th, 2022 Planning Commission hearing. If you wish to make a comment on a specific case item, please email your comments, 250 words or less, to planning.pccomments at ventura.org. Please indicate in the subject line the agenda item number. Item five is public comments not addressed on this agenda. Item 7A is case PL21-0047, applicant Warren Wigger. Item 7B is case PL21-0002, JLB Ranch La Vista LLC. Staff will read your comment to the Planning Commission. Comments received after an agenda item will be made part of the record if received prior to the end of the meeting. Members of the public who wish to speak, please press the raise hand button on Zoom now, or if participating by telephone, press star and then nine to be queued for this agenda item number uh, five, sorry. Okay, thank you, Secretary Verduzco. Item number four, consent item, resolution authorizing continued remote teleconferencing meetings of the Planning Commission. Do I have a motion? Uh, I move approval of the consent calendar item. Moved by Commissioner King. Is there a second? Seconded by Commissioner Aducas. Secretary Reduzco, would you call the roll, please? Chair McPhail. Aye. Commissioner King. Aye. Commissioner Aducas. Aye. Commissioner Garcia. Aye. Commissioner Boydson. Aye. Item number five, consent item number four, passes, five will vote. Item number five, public comments. Secretary Dusko, do we have any public comments? I don't have any public comments for items that are not on the agenda. Uh, I do have various um, public comments, but those will be for the actual cases. Okay, thank you. Approval of minutes for December 16th, 2021 and January 6th, 2022. Do I have a motion? Chair, Chair McPhail, you should take each separately and uh, run through the, the vote. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Minutes for December 16th, 2021. Commissioner Dukas. Move approval. Is there a second? Seconded by Commissioner King. Secretary Dusko, would you please call the roll? Chair McPhail. Aye. Commissioner Boydson. Aye. 
Commissioner Idukis? Aye. Commissioner King? Aye. Commissioner Garcia? Aye. Motion carries. A motion for the minutes for January 6, 2022. Move to approve. Moved by Commissioner Boyston, seconded by Commissioner Idukas. Secretary Renee, would you please call the roll? Chair McPhail? Aye. Commissioner Boyston? Aye. Commissioner Idukas? Aye. Commissioner King? Aye. Commissioner Garcia? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Item number seven. Case number PL21-0047, applicant Warren Wigginer. Project description, the applicant requests approval of a conditional use permit for the construction, operation, and maintenance of a non-commercial ham radio antenna. Project location 2065, Kalye Yaka. Assessor parcel number 663-0-402-0. 025. Case planner Thomas Chaffee. Mr. Chaffee, the floor is yours. Good morning, Chair McPhail and members of the Planning Commission. My name is Thomas Chaffee and I'm the case planner on the project before you today. The project is an appeal of the planning director's decision to deny a conditional use permit for the Thomas, operation. Thomas, I apologize. Uh, Chair McPhail, I don't think we did the resolution, the consent item on the resolution for continuing the teleconference hearing. Yeah, and we did. It. You did? Yeah, I'm did. sorry. Okay. I apologize. Thank you. Sorry, Thomas. No, that's all right. Uh, Chair Good morning, McPhail? Chair McPhail. Was there something more? I'm sorry. Chair McPhail? Yes. Uh, we didn't uh, get disclosures on this item. Oh, you're right. Thank you, Commissioner King. <clears throat> At this time, I would like to ask each planning commissioner to state on the record whether or not he or she has received any oral or written ex parte communication regarding this agenda item that is not already contained in the record before us on this matter. Please disclose the substance of that information only if that information is not contained in the record before us on this matter. Secretary Radusco, would you please pull the commission? Chair McPhail? No disclosures. Commissioner Garcia? No disclosures. Commissioner King? Um, while I'm not required to disclose this, I think it would be only fair to the commissioners and the applicants and the public to know that um, until this last August, I was a amateur extra class uh, ham radio operator for 30 years. And so um, I may have knowledge of issues around this uh, application and appeal that commissioners might not uh, otherwise have, and I want, want to make sure everybody knows that going in. Okay. Any other disclosures? N not from me. Okay. Commissioner Boydson? No disclosures. Commissioner Idukas? Yes. Um, I drove the neighborhood and um, uh, took photographs because um, the property in question is about four doors down from um, a, a very large trail system. Uh, they At the end of Yucca, of Calle Yucca, is the Windmere Trail, which leads to Wildwood Park. I took pictures because there are um, um, distinctive um, tall trees uh, near the subject property that um, I used as a like a, a point finder for lack of a better word. 
um, to see that um, the if if this is approved, it will be visible from Wildwood Park along the Linmere Trail. Also, I drove around the neighborhood. There's several streets where um, if it was approved, it would um, be visible to um, not just immediate neighbors, but the larger neighborhood. The, uh, the area in question is part of a, a very large um, sloping you know, hillside that has been developed with houses at higher and lower and lower elevations as you as you uh, as you drive uh, drive from from far away, and also um, if this were approved, um, it would silhouette um, against the uh, ridge line uh, that is behind the homes that are across the street. So um, I wanted to just. Uh, share that I, I saw the, you know, I visited the physical site and made these uh, notes. Okay, any other disclosures? Okay, no further disclosures. We're back to Thomas. All right. Good morning, Chair McPhail and members of the Planning Commission. My name is Thomas Chafee and I'm the case planner on the project before you today. The project is an appeal of the Planning Director's decision to deny a conditional use permit for the operation of a non-commercial ham radio facility. As a reminder for those who are watching from home, Planning Commission public comments of 250 words or less can be submitted to planning.pccomments at ventura.org with the subject line indicating agenda item 7A. This morning, I will be given a quick overview of the project location, project history and description, grounds of appeal and staff responses and recommended actions. Please allow me to give an overview of the project location. The site location is within the unincorporated community of Lynn Ranch at the top of Calle Yucca. The site is currently developed with a single family residence. The zoning for the subject location is RO 20,000 square feet, which is single family estate, 20,000 square foot minimum lot size. And the general plan designation is very low density residential. The site location is surrounded by existing single family residences. Here's a picture of the subject property from the street view of Calle Yucca showing the existing setting. I will now go over the project description and history. For some context, let me explain what the zoning ordinance allows. The Ventura County Non-Coastal Zoning Ordinance states that a non-commercial antenna may be constructed up to a 40 foot height limit with a ministerial application. Any antenna proposed over 40 feet up to a limit of 75 feet requires discretionary review and a conditional use permit. The applicant requests a CUP for the installation, operation and maintenance of a ham non-commercial radio antenna consisting of one collapsible 55 foot tall antenna support structure and a 10 foot galvanized mass on top for a combined total of 65 feet above grade. Here's the overhead site plan and bird's eye view of the subject parcel. The antenna support structure would be located at the rear of the existing residence within an existing planner. The project was deemed complete on June 29th, 2021 a planning director hearing was held on August 19th, 2021. And at that time, staff was recommending approval of the project. Due to the number of public speakers and limited time, the hearing was continued until September 2nd. At the continued public hearing, a lot of public testimony was again received. The planning director took all comments into consideration. And after attempting to work out a solution with the applicant, 
the planning director denied the project on October 12th, 2021. A timely appeal was then filed on October 22nd, or sorry, October 21st. The planning director was unable to find that the proposed project is compatible with the surrounding development, would not impair the utility of neighboring properties, would not be detrimental to the public interest, and would not be compatible with the existing land uses in the area of Lynn Ranch. We will explain later in the presentation why these findings could not be made. I will now go over the grounds of appeal and staff response. The applicant's ground of appeal indicates that the planning division's denial of the CUP was arbitrary and capricious and inconsistent with state and federal law. As further stated here, the applicant asserts that the county has not provided reasonable accommodation of the proposed non-commercial ham radio antenna. In response, federal law requires that local regulations must be crafted to reasonably accommodate amateur communications and represent the minimum practical regulation to accomplish the local authority's legitimate purpose. A local government is not required to allow an applicant to erect a tower of any size, regardless of the tower antenna's compatibility with the surrounding neighborhood. In order to grant the CUP, seven findings, what, sorry about that. The non-coastal zoning ordinance standards for non-commercial radio towers um, allow a ministerial permit to erect them up to 40 feet in height. Above 40 feet and up to 75 feet requires a discretionary permit and the approval of a conditional use permit. The planning division offered reasonable accommodation to the applicant to extend the tower to 65 feet during nighttime hours, but retract it to 40 feet during daytime when the visual impacts are pronounced. To grant the CUP, the applicant has must prove that he has met the burden that the standards have been met, including compatibility with surroundings. In order to grant the CUP, seven findings must be met. The planning director could not make four of the required findings. These are that the proposed development is compatible with the character of the surrounding development, would not impair the utility of neighboring property, would not be detrimental to the public interest, and would be compatible with existing and potential land uses in the area. In terms of neighborhood compatibility, there are no other man-made structures above 40 feet in the neighborhood. The proposed 65 foot antenna would also be visible from both public and private vantage points in the community. In working with the applicant to make the antenna compatible, they were unwilling to keep the antenna retracted during daylight hours. Here are some recent pictures of the surrounding community from public viewpoints. As shown, there are no other man-made structures exceeding 40 feet in the vicinity. Following the planning director hearing, but prior to a decision being made, the planning division attempted to work with the applicant to make the facility compatible with the surrounding community. A condition was proposed to have the facility retracted to 40 feet in height during daylight hours and extended to 65 feet at nighttime. The applicant rejected this proposal. Staff recommends your commission deny the appeal and the conditional use permit. As a reminder for those who are watching from home, Planning Commission public comments of 250 words or less can be submitted to planning.pccomments@ventura.org with subject line indicating agenda item 7A. Members of the public who wish to speak, please press the raise hand button on Zoom now, or if participating by telephone, please press the star key and then nine to be queued. This is for agenda item 7A. I'm available for any questions you may have. The appellant team is also available on Zoom and has a presentation they would like to present. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chafee. 
Is there any questions from the commission for staff? Commissioner King. Uh, thank you, Commissioner McPhail. Um, first of all, uh, Planner Chapey, uh, are you aware uh, of whether the, uh, the property in the neighborhood in question uh, lie in a scenic view overlay zone? It is not zoned in the scenic uh, resource protection zone. Okay, thank you. Uh, second, do you know if this neighborhood has a homeowner association and is governed by uh, CCNRs? That I am unaware of. I know this is out of the um, Lynn Ranch Property Owners Association. Um, so I am not aware of any HOA or CCNRs that um, are required for this property. Um, that being said, um, the, the county usually doesn't get too involved with HOAs and CCNRs, um, so I haven't actually dug too deeply. Um, the, uh, the applicant um, and appellant, maybe the public, would be able to further explain the HOA um, concerns. Okay, and my last question for you is, in the initial staff report that went to the planning director for the planning director's hearing, uh, the staff found the project to be exempt from CEQA. In our staff report, it says that um, even if we were to uh, grant the appeal and uphold the project, that it couldn't go forward because a, a, a CEQA study would be required in a CEQA finding. Uh, when I talked to you on the phone the other day, you said the reason was the 40-foot issue. However, the 40-foot issue is what's available for a ministerial, whereas the height that the applicant proposes is allowable with the CUP. And at the time that the staff report was prepared for the planning director, uh, it was known that this was a CUP application. Can you explain the discrepancy? Yeah, when this application first came in, um, it, it came in as a collapsible 65 foot tower. Um, and it was specifically stated that it would be 21 foot in the collapsible position. Um, so when we took it in for review, um, our, our original assumption was going through CEQA, it would be a small structure, it would be collapsed um, the majority of the time, um, unless the operator was in active use of the ham radio. Um, then it would be extended. So the original planning director one was using a small facility exemption um, in anticipation that it would be in the collapsed position for the majority of the time. Um, after going through the process with the applicant um, and the public and the public hearings, it was disclosed that basically this, this would ne never be collapsed. It would basically be at 65 feet um, for the entire time. Um, so that is where the kind of back and forth with the CEQA exemption went. It, it, if we did decide to approve this project, we would have to do some further review on CEQA. Um, and uh, in addition, the site plans that were, that were submitted with the application um, didn't include the actual antenna that was proposed. Um, so there may be more visual aesthetic impacts um, that pop up in the CEQA process. Um, that's where the discrepancy came. Um, if you have any further questions or if I can clarify anything further, um, please let me know. Well, uh, let me ask you something. Was there anything in the application that said that the antenna would be collapsed most of the time or any of the time? Um, it was submitted as a collapsible antenna. It was not necessarily um, explained how long it would be collapsed or not collapsed. No. Okay. So your original sequel finding was made um, with no understanding of how it would, would be used, only your assumptions about how it would be used. So would that be a correct statement? Um, that, that would be a correct statement. And yes, yes, that, 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 is, that was the um, impression when it was submitted. Um, 
All right. Yes, that's correct. And, uh, that being the case, um, I guess my question is, what it, does the uh, um, uh, non-coastal zoning ordinance uh, describe what um, a small facility, is that defined anywhere in the ordinance? Whether a 40 foot tower is, uh, uh, is different in terms of CEQA analysis from a, from a 65 foot uh, structure? Is that anywhere in the, uh, in the ordinance? No, it wouldn't be called out in the ordinance. Um, it's a case by case basis when it, when it comes to CEQA. Um, so it, it, it depends on the, the setting where it's located, um, how it's designed. Um, for instance, you know, we, we, we've brought in cell towers that are designed as fake pine trees. We brought them forward with, with exemptions because they're, they're in with another grove of pines. Um, but if it was sticking out with nothing surrounding it, um, that may not qualify for the exemption. So it, 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 it's a case-by-case -case basis in terms of CEQA. Okay, well, you know, having been well-educated uh, in the, the most recent uh, uh, workshops that uh, Director Ward signed us up for, uh, I'm kind of aware that these sweet CEQA determinations are a little watery and there's there seems to be a lot of discussion, but I just kind of wanted to feel out staff on that. I have a couple of questions related to this project for um, uh, Council Barnes and or his crack legal team. Uh, and I kind of gave him a heads up on this. Chair McPhail, so, Commissioner King, I, I just wanted to add one more clarification onto your CEQA questions. And that revolves the, the public process. CEQA is very much focused on public input, and that input is part of a final CEQA determination. And so staff's analysis of the original proposal and going to the original planning director hearing is then informed by public comment, just like you have public comment in your hearing today. That's under consideration and a planning director decision isn't made at the date of the hearing, that information is analyzed. So a CEQA determination can, change through the difference in information provided from the public. And so that's why the CEQA analysis potentially going forward, if there's a different direction from your commission would still need to be evaluated. Okay, well, and I appreciate the clarification. Um, now, Council Barnes, um, we had a conversation about, um, well, let me preface this by saying, the way I framed my thinking about this case, um, and I may, I'm not a lawyer and I don't know how to practice law and I'm not privileged to practice law, but the way I framed my thinking was that amateur radio uh, station license is a privilege extended by the FCC under uh, private uh, radio branch one in the FCC regs. And um, the applicant in his appeal and in his initial uh, application cited that along with several legal cases. Uh, have you been able to, uh, and those legal cases talked about uh, limiting the regulation so that it doesn't unreasonably limit the ability of an amateur radio operator to, to, you know, use his privilege to communicate with his equipment. And uh, also in uh, PRB1, when it was updated in, I think, 1999, I could have the date wrong. When they updated it, they also talked about uh, balancing the needs of a uh, amateur radio operator exercising his privileges and uh, the community in providing regulation for things like aesthetics. And in that update, they clearly stated that um, applying a balance analysis would be inconsistent with PRV1. Having said all of that, 
and having read the um, the applicants uh, citing of several cases, uh, Botany versus uh, Incorporated Village of Sand Point, Pentel versus the City of Mendoza, and Palmer versus the City of Saratoga Springs. Uh, I asked you to see if your staff could identify other case law that found differently than these cases, which seem to uphold the uh, uphold the commission's belief that since it, as a federal agency, can extend the privilege, it as a federal agency can restrict other people from uh, limiting the, the ex exercise of that privilege. So have you found any case law that supports uh, the alternate view? Uh, yes, we have. Um, and uh, I, uh, Commissioner King, I, I, I think, it, I mean, the, the way, and Jacqueline Smith, um, my colleague, can address more specifically what, what the, the federal standard is here. There's, um, you know, as you state, federal law does, um, uh, establish some rules for this use, but bottom line, it, like you said, it is a, a balancing that needs to occur. The planning division has balanced both in terms of crafting um, the current wireless regulations with the 40-foot ministerial permit and the CEP requirement for going above, and the planning division has also balanced and attempted to accommodate the applicant in this specific case. Um, one important big picture legal rule to keep in mind is that you know we, we more typically deal with cell tower applications there's a more um, th there's a basically a, a much stronger more specific federal preemption that applies in those cases the rule in those cases is um, we essentially must approve a cell tower application that's needed to close a gap in the carrier's coverage as long as it's the least intrusive means of closing that gap. Uh, that same rule does not apply here. Uh, ham radio operators um, do absolutely do not have the right to, to have an antenna as high as they want. Um, that's just not the rule. Uh, so I'll let um, Ms. Smith um, talk in, in more detail about the rule and, and the planning division might be able to provide some more background about uh, their outreach and um, consultation with the ham community when we adopted the ordinance in 2015 and um, and even maybe go into some more detail about their meetings with the neighbors and the, the applicant in this case. Jacqueline, are you uh, are you on the, um, the Zoom? I am, thanks Jeff. And thank you Commissioner King for your questions. Um, I, I did review the legal authorities that the applicant provided and I'm aware and familiar with PRB1 which you referred to as well. Um, that's the federal rule that the FCC has put out on these amateur radio tower communications. And really what that rule provides is a limited preemption policy. And what that limited preemption policy um, provides is that local governments cannot enact ordinances that totally um, ban these types of towers, but the PRB1 did not place any kind of restriction on local governments to enact ordinances that limit the height or other features of these types of towers. And what PRB1 says is that when a local government does regulate the height of these towers, what they need to do is provide reasonable accommodation and that those height restrictions constitute the minimum practical regulation necessary to achieve the local government's legitimate purpose in this instance, which is to have orderly land use development. So really the standards that your commission is looking at today is whether the NCZO and how it was applied here provides reasonable accommodation for amateur radio towers and whether it it affords or, or whether those standards are the minimum practical regulation to, you know, um, establish rules 
for the development of land use in our county and where these towers can be erected and what those heights should be. So the, the local ordinance, the NCZO here, sets those height restrictions at 40 feet for a ministerial permit and 75 feet for a discretionary permit. And, and the position of the planning division is that those height restrictions, those thresholds do reasonably accommodate amateur radio towers. They allow for them at a range of heights, um, even up to 75 feet, so long as the findings of, for a CUP can be made. Um, and, and also allow for towers up to 40 feet, essentially by right. And, and um, Aaron Engstrom is also on the call and can speak to the legislative history of those height thresholds and why the county determined that those were the minimum restrictions practicable in this area of land use. Um, and there is, Commissioner King, I know you're aware of this case, but the city of Palmdale case, um, where the court found in that a, even a 55 foot tower, which the city denied um, was appropriate. It was appropriate in that case for the city to deny um, the applicant's uh, request for a 55 foot tower because it was not compatible with the surrounding neighborhood. So there are cases that support the planning commission's position here. Um, the cases cited by the applicant are not controlling in this district. They're not from the state. Um, so that's kind of the, the landscape of the rules and the cases as we see them. Um, and I'm happy to answer any other questions you might have. Okay. Um, again, I'm not trying to practice law here. My, con my fundamental concern is these case, there, there is a lot of case law, in my opinion, and it goes both ways. The question becomes one of however we act, is that going to uh, create a burden on county legal staff to defend those fine, you know, those uh, decisions down the road? Because, uh, you know, that would really be what's driving me is if we err on the side of trying to protect a the viewshed, then, um, uh, and that is found not to be uh, defensible, you know, how much are we going to have to spend to defend that? I mean, I, I you know, any answer you give is probably going to be speculative, and, but and, at least I think we have to consider that. And we're, we're as Jacqueline stated, we're, we're comfortable with, uh, absolutely comfortable with the planning division's recommendation. Um, we think there's ample facts, including facts uh, presented by Commissioner Dukas that show that this this tower would would provide would uh, cause an aesthetic impact given its location, um, and uh, so we're comfortable with that. But th the message, all, all we're saying is that federal law does not compel the county to approve the project as proposed by the applicant. That's all we're saying. Um, if your commission thinks that's the right decision to make. Uh, that's completely within uh, your jurisdiction, obviously. All we're saying is that we do not have to approve it as proposed. Um, so I just want to be crystal clear on that. And again, we're comfortable legally with that recommendation. Okay, I had one more question I forgot to ask, and that is, is there case law that establishes uh, residential owners uh, right to uh, an unimpeded view? Uh, no, but that's not um, that's not needed. It's uh, the aesthetic uh, interests are reflected in in case law on this on this issue. It's a valid public concern. The it's it's not outweighed by a ham radio operator's absolute right to to have an antenna um, as they propose. And so it's it's an absolutely valid concern. Okay, that's all the questions I have for staff. I have several for the applicant as well, just so you'll know I'm balanced. Uh, I think Chair uh, Commissioner Dukas raised her hand. Yeah, Commissioner Dukas. Thank you. Um, I wanted to um, direct this question. Um, 
well, to uh, appropriate staff. Um, what we have is a de novo hearing, which means we're um, independently uh, going back on, on uh, this as if it came to the commission in the first place. What configuration is before us today? Uh, uh, Commissioner Adukas, through the chair, I'll take a stab at that. Um, really what's before you today is a is just a recommendation for denial uh, since we don't have all of the approval documents set up as of now with conditions of approval. So if your commission were to um, disagree with our findings and recommend different findings, uh, we would ask that you direct us to come back with the approval documents, including um, clarifying the proposal from the applicant that you are asking us to bring back. So I believe it would be a 65 foot tower with a 32 foot um, horizontal Yagi antenna at the top. Okay, th because that's that's different than the first thing with the collapsible down to 22 feet. So that was that's my key question is what are we looking at here? Is it the 55 collapsible down to 22 and a half? Or is it the one with um, whatever antenna is on the top? That's not, not we, we can't determine what kind of antenna anybody uses. Our, our, little, our little area of, of um, authority has to do with that support structure. So that's really key to me. Thank you for that, Commissioner. And, and I think we would want to clarify that with the applicant if we were going to bring this back for approval as exactly, is it collapsible and to what height um, and to, to make sure we get those clarifications. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Any other commit questions from commissioners? Commissioner Boyston? I guess I have a question for um, uh, Mr. Ward, um, and it would have to do with sort of some history going back on the ministerial, what was the thought process on the ministerial 40 foot requirements? Um, and then the CUP, what, what brought that all on? What, what kind of discussion and what was the intent? Certainly Vice Chair Voitson, thank you. I was not with the county at that time, but we do have planning manager, Aaron Ingstrom here. He was instrumental as the lead planner processing the wireless and communications ordinance update. So Aaron, if you could help give us some of that history and perspective, that would be great. Yes, good morning, everybody. Good morning, commissioners. And Thank you for inviting me to attend this meeting. And so back in 2014, 2015, uh, my name is Aaron Ingstrom. I'm the Area Plans and Resources Manager for the Planning Division. And uh, one of my first projects at the Planning Division was actually working on this, the wireless ordinance back in 2014, 2015. And you know, basically <clears throat> we were tasked with updating the commercial, stand, the commercial facility standards for these, these facilities. It's, a large um, portion of our permitting uh, load workload, so we needed clear standards for commercial facilities. And when we worked on the project, began the project, we drafted some standards. And the intent was to um, not get into and not go into new standards for amateur radio facilities, but rather to separate them as non-commercial facilities and then focus on the commercial facilities. And so. We conducted very minor amendments to the standards for amateur radio facilities. We clarified that they were indeed non-commercial uses. And um, we clarified items like how height was measured and um, noted that if they're on a historic structure, then some of the historic provisions would apply for conservation of the structure. So, you know, back in 2014, 2015, we did not change the height limits. The height limits, you know, date back to, you know, I looked in the, you know, at least 1987. So those standards have been in place now for, you know, close to 50 years. And so <clears throat> um, basically we did meet with, though, with the amateur radio community during the project. We conducted outreach. We went up to Thousand Oaks and at the sheriff's station there where they have some facilities, I believe. And so there was a large 
um, contingent of amateur radio interests that expressed the need for, um, they wanted uh, revised standards, kind of a standalone ordinance, but that was not in our scope of work at the time. So <clears throat> basically uh, we made those changes. We met with them a couple more times in small groups. We made some adjustments to respond to their concerns that would facilitate uh, addition of repeater stations if needed, that would be offsite to help um, with the communications and allows you know, zoning clearances for those to be placed on other facilities. So amateur radio could team up with other facilities um, to deploy additional antennas you know, offsite. But, uh, but, and the, the overarching concern too was when the community was, you know, if they were to develop a standalone facility that's not accessory to a dwelling, how would that work? And, and so, you know, today is an accessory dwelling, um, accessory structure to a dwelling. And so it's, um, you know, overall and back in 2014, 2015, there was not a lot of concern about, you know, this element of the, um, this use, right? It was mostly about standalone facilities, but we did conduct research on the FCC guidance. We looked at other jurisdiction standards and determined basically that, yeah, the 40 foot um, standard is, you know, is acceptable. It's close to within the height limits for other structures in the neighborhoods. Over that, um, the, you know, the, the discretionary process allows the neighbors to be noticed, allows the planning division to try to mitigate the impacts. And so we determined that, that, yeah, it is reasonable accommodation. It's uh, the least restrictive standards. And, you know, those, the standards um, do accomplish the county's purpose to achieve orderly land use development. And so hopefully that summary helps. It does. It, just a follow up. Um, was it ever discussed uh, that a 40 foot height was a usable height um, and not restrictive in so far as um, somebody using a hand, ham, having a, an operating system like this, is 40 foot height usable? Yeah, it depends on the specific situations and circumstances, but generally speaking, you know, any height is, is usable that, you know, they use a, you know, very small antennas for parades and those sorts of things, and then go, go higher depending on how far they want to extend their communications, you know, around the globe, right? So, you know, a forty-footer may not get as far as you know the other side of the of the world here, but it, you know, it could communicate ostensibly on a on a local, regional, possible statewide, you know, level. But again, it's the you know, it's very sp specific to the location and the conditions and all those sorts of things. So. Um, generally speaking, the 40 foot seemed, re you know, reasonable to allow and, uh, you know, it's kind of, you know, the upper range of something that could be permitted ministerially in, ministerially in a residential neighborhood without, you know, without having an industrial looking structure placed in a residential neighborhood. And that's inconsistent with the FCC guidance and their, you know, 1999 revisiting of PRB1 and of balancing the needs and, and so. Thank you. Welcome. Any other questions from commissioners? I have one. In the staff report, it happens very rarely, but in the letters of op opposition to this CUP, the names of the people who were uh, had written in to oppose this uh, CUP, their names and addresses were redacted. Redacted is. Can you explain why? Uh, Chair McPhail, this is Mindy Fogg. Um, this is. Uh, it's not always a common practice. It has been suggested that we do that on occasion where you have neighbor versus neighbor and just trying to minimize the amount of, of neighbor conflict. And so I think in this case, staff um, took, a, took the extra mile of just removing names and contact information and having um, the, the context of just the comments. However, uh, we did have neighbors come to both of the planning director hearings and speak openly. 
Well, I, I just have a problem with redacting uh, people who are opposed to a particular project because I feel the applicant has a right to know who's opposing or she has a right to know who's opposing their project. So I will ask, I have a question for uh, Mr. Barnes then. Uh, is this a, a acceptable legal practice to do that? Uh, you, you know, that, that, that's a, a good question. Um, uh, it, it's a gray area. Uh, if someone did make a Public Records Act request for the unredacted documents, uh, we, we would have to cross that bridge. Um, uh, and and the, the documents existed. So um, yeah, I think it's I think it's a questionable practice, um, honestly. Uh, and I think we might have to disclose the records if there's a Public Records Act request. It's different um, than uh, when someone's making a, a formal complaint to code compliance. In those circumstances, there's a specific uh, rule saying that the, the complaining party's identity does not need to be disclosed. Um, but yeah, in this context, it's different. Um, if, if someone's information isn't provided, then, and I think this is your concern, uh, the weight of the evidence or the weight of the comments um, would logically be discounted because you, you don't know where they live. You don't know even know if, uh, if it's a real person in this day and age. And I'm not saying that they're made up, but that's, that's kind of why when someone's commenting, and I, I agree with you, you'd want to know who they are and where they live so you can weigh, weigh the weight uh, of the evidence uh, in their comments. Thank you, because the reason I brought that up is almost all of the redacted comments were a foreign letter, exactly the same each time. And that bothers me as, as a decision maker that uh, they could be real or not real. And that's why I brought it up because I think it's a, it's a, it's a, I guess for a lack of a better comment, it's kind of a rabbit hole that I don't think planning really wants to go down because uh, it's not, it's not good practice in my opinion to do that. So with that said, is there any other questions from commissioners? Hi, I have a follow-up question, Chair McPhail, for Director. Go ahead. Uh, for Director, uh, for Director Ingstrom. You were um, just your your last comment about what's appropriate for commercial versus residential. I just had a follow-up clarif clarifying question for you about whether uh, the our zoning ordinance has any. Uh, provides any language around what would be appropriate for a residential setting versus commercial. Just wanted to see if you could touch on, on that. Sure. Uh, Commissioner Garcia, and I'm just, uh, just a manager here, but um, <laughs> um, yeah, so basically we, uh, you know, we approached the ordinance amendments to sort of um, have a fork in the road with these, communication facilities, right? And so the, there is one side of the fork was the commercial components and the other side is the amateur radio community. And so um, they're both wireless communication facilities. We embarked on standards that focused on the commercial facilities. So that's like Thomas uh, Planner Chafee alluded to the, you know, faux standards for um, for stealth facilities that don't have visual impacts. And, and those, you know, there's pages and pages of development standards for commercial facilities. The, uh, there, is lim there are limited development standards for amateur radio in the zoning ordinance, but they do discuss things like, um, you know, blending these in with the surrounding setting and having a, you know, this, I think it uses the term crank up when feasible or should you should be a crank up variety. And, you know, to use, um, again, colors that blend in, you know, just to, to sort of, work around um, options on a, on a <clears throat> site specific level, but it, yeah, it doesn't go into the same level of detail as the commercial facilities with requiring the faux trees and the tree planting around them and all that. So, so really the standards are, are there, there's, le there's fewer standards for amateur radio facilities than there are for commercial facilities within our ordinance, but there are some. 
Well, and and the the what I was looking for confirmation of is that the there is language that objective objectively states blending in is part of the criteria, even though the standards are limited. I think that's what I heard you say. Correct. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comments? With that, I will open the public hearing. Uh, we will now have a presentation from the appellant, Mr. Wigginer, or Mr. Robinson. Oh, uh, you got up. My, my video is my video is cut off. This, this is I think they're Robinson. just starting to uh, unlock us here, Bill. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is this is Bill Robinson. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Let me before before Warren starts. It's and I, let me just a little background on on myself. Uh, I, I'm a ham radio operator. Um, I'm a volunteer counsel for the American Radio Relay League. Uh, I do tech. I do uh, technology trial litigation for a living. Um, Warren has asked me to help out, and since. Uh, what we've had so far is largely a, a discussion of the law. Before Warren gets into some of the, I guess, the, the, the techie parts, I want to comment uh, on two things that has been said so far. And I think Commissioner King was the one who said it. And the first part is that he read out of the SEC ruling that a balancing of interests is not appropriate. Now, we then heard Mr. Barnes talk about balancing. PRB1 and the California equivalent say you must reasonably accommodate amateur mm. communications. The moment you get into balancing of views and the like, you have completely ignored the mandate of PRB1. You completely gone, ignored the mandate of the California statute the California Government Code 658, uh, 6580.3. So you're down a path which is fraught with not only peril, but is simply not right. Now, the second thing Mr. or Commissioner King asked, is there any case law that supports the commission's position? Now, what you heard was a, a resounding, uh, no, no case being identified, uh, one person talked about the, the uh, city of Palmdale case, and they said, well, in that one, um, views were taken into account. What she didn't say was the ordinance was knocked out because it was impermissibly vague. And, and the notion that, that the city of Palmdale, which is a Calap case, is not controlling is simply wrong as a matter of law. Now, the last point I wanted to make before Warren talks is this idea of 40 feet. 40 feet is an arbitrary standard which is not reasonably accommodating of anything. Warren made the initial showing in his presentation of the need for intercontinental communications, and he's got some more data uh, that was presented in, in the appeal. And the issue is, is 40 feet the reasonable minimum accommodation to do intercontinental antenna uh, or ham radio communications. The, abs the question is absolutely, it is not a reasonable accommodation. It is a standard, it was 40 feet was simply something pulled out of the air. I mean, if you wanna do ham radio communications with a handheld, you can stand in your backyard with a little, with a little handheld device. If you wanna talk uh, intercontinentally, 40 feet is not a, 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 a height that is sufficient to accommodate amateur radio communications. So this, you know, and, and, and 75 feet is probably a good height, but, uh, you know, this 40 foot thing is not a reasonable accommodation. And, and lastly, um, the, the condition that was imposed that this thing would only be uh, raised at night made absolutely no sense because, and I think uh, the Commissioner King knows this, intercontinental communications are based upon sunspots. The, the higher, the more sunspots, the, the, we have, if you can imagine a big aluminum foil sheet around the earth, 
that, a free, that allows amateur communications to bounce, which is how they get from here around the curvature of the earth to Africa or Asia or South America, that works best during the day. The, same, the sun is down at night, sunspots drop at night. So, I mean, it would be one thing to have imposed a condition that said, if you're not using it, crank it down. I mean, I, I, I live in Manhattan Beach. It's a, it's a nice area with expensive views and ocean views and downtown views. There's quite a few ham radio antennas in Manhattan Beach. Um, I have a 65 footer. And the, the, the condition that was imposed upon me is if you're not using it, lower it, fine. It worked great. Because during the day, if I'm home, since I am working at home much more than I want to, uh, I, I can use it. But I, I think, I, I think this this notion of 40 foot being somehow sufficient uh, with no proof, and and Warren's got a a presentation that shows 65 feet is what you need and is the reasonable accommodation. That's the test of the height. And the moment you get into balancing. Which, which is entirely what neighbor views and aesthetics are all about, you run smack into the federal law. And if your ordinance is not gonna be preempted, you gotta to toss out balancing, at least for 65 feet. With that, I'll let Warren talk. Thank, thank you for your consideration. Mr. Ligonier, I'm sorry, I probably mispronounced your name. Good morning. Um, that's not uncommon. Uh, at, at the university, they'd get to the end of the roll call and they'd go, whoa, whoa, whoa. And I'd say, just call me Warren. So that's perfectly <laughs> fine. It's three syllables, wig, er, er. So I, it gave me trouble forever. Good morning, uh, commissioners. Thank you for your time and attention to this. Um, I'm not a professional presenter. So if I stumble a little bit, please forgive me. And it turns out this morning I woke up with some chest congestion and a, a whole community of frogs that have moved in. So I may need to mute at some point. Um, you, you have met my attorney, Mr. Robinson. And as he says, he's a, a volunteer counsel with the American Radio Relay League, which is the largest uh, group of ham radio enthusiasts with over 160,000 members here in the United States. I am Warren, I'm the applicant, and I will be trying my best to do a decent presentation for you. Um, in talking with Mr. Robinson, uh, I, I've come to realize that after working for decades as an engineer, I became very accustomed to dealing with a lot of details and some of them fairly uh, small and finding ways to, to fit them together. But it would seem like with the presentation that I, I provided to county yesterday to give you the PowerPoint presentation, I may have, uh, as I think the newspapers say, buried the lead. And this has come up uh, already in our discussion uh, today. And if you'll give me a moment to just try to read this, because I want to definitely get it correct. This is about that 1999 clarification that the FCC issued regarding this law that's become known as PRB1. And in this paragraph seven of it, it says the petitioner, which was the American Radio Relay League, further requests a clarification of PRB1 that local authorities must not engage in balancing their enactments against the interest that the federal government has in amateur radio. But rather must reasonably accommodate amateur communications. We do not believe, this is the FCC still speaking, we do not believe a clarification is necessary because the PRB1 decision precisely stated the principle of reasonable accommodation. In PRB1, the commission stated, nevertheless, local regulations which involve placement, screening, or height of antennas based on health, safety, or aesthetic considerations must be crafted to accommodate reasonably amateur communications and to represent the minimum practicable regulation to accomplish the local authority's legitimate purpose. The FCC finally concludes that paragraph by saying, given this express communication language, it is clear 
that a balancing of interests approach is not appropriate in this context. So working with my attorney, I understand that really the key things that we should be focusing on in this hearing is my need to have an antenna of height and size sufficient to meet my communications demands. Also, the legal requirement that you as a local regulating association or authority must provide reasonable accommodation to meet those needs. And then you have to have an open mind and remember that a balancing of interests, such as the director's actions, considering my neighbor's view, is not permissible. And that's, you know, I, I can understand where the director was coming from. He wanted to try to balance the neighbor concerns with my needs. And he tried to do it. But balancing the, the neighbor's view objections against my needs for an adequate antenna system is just not permissible under that clarification that the FCC issued. So respectfully, it it essentially means, as my attorney has explained to me, the neighbor's view objections cannot be entered into this consideration, or you would be balancing. That's not permissible. And let me move us forward a little bit, see if I know how to, oh, I'm going to have a small problem here. Let me figure out how I do this. I will share my screen now if that's okay. Go ahead. Yeah, press press this. I think it's a share screen button. Yes, sir. I'll do that and then I will be able to do that. So can you see my uh yep. cover page? Yes, sir. All right, very good. Thank you. Um so um, actually addressing a few of the questions that were asked also uh, to clarify. I started this process with the county in February. Originally I was told I should apply for a zone clearance. And so uh, the diagram that you saw, which was dated in March, was at the request of, um, where have I got his name? Clay Downing. He was my case planner initially. He left this aspect of the department, apparently. And somewhere around May, I was then instructed that I needed to reply in, in, uh, apply for a conditional use permit. So the diagram you sh saw showing the project collapsed is true, but also uh, old information. And I've been asked many times, what will it look like? What will it look like? And so I've always tried to be transparent with the county and give all the information necessary. However, by the time the CUP was specified, I have always said it's a 55 foot tall support structure with a 10 foot pipe, we call that a mast, at the top. And these structures, um, I, I chose it because that's, for one reason, because that's what the county wants in its uh, zoning ordinances. So here's a, a, a very short uh, summary of it. This is commercially manufactured. The, the base is triangular. It meets the, tele, the crank up the telescoping concept. It has a galvanized finish, which is a very dull matte gray, very similar to battleship gray, which the Navy has chosen to try to hide their ships because we know that the sky is blue, but the horizon is always gray. It's 22 inches wide at the bottom and 15 inches wide at the top. And that's the outside dimensions of it. The mast is two inches wide. And then the antenna that goes on the top uh, is about 16 feet on either side, and it will be mounted at about the 60 foot level. You do not, uh, you do not zone for, you do not authorize antennas and that would be inappropriate because amateur radio is an experimental service. We develop antennas, we change antennas. So it's appropriate that you wouldn't do it. But to be transparent here, I intend that I will also have a wire antenna attached to the support 
at about the 55 foot level. So here's a diagram to give you uh, something visual to, to try to understand. The support structure goes up to 55 feet. Uh, on my screen, the heights are hidden behind the uh, participants' faces, but I hope you can see that this area here is at 55 feet. The antenna attaches to the mast at 60, and the total height is 65. The reason for this extra height here is because these booms being long, they tend to sag. They don't, the manufacturers don't want to make them out of heavy material to be completely rigid. So a wire, much like a, uh, think of a, a picture hanger, the, the V wire on the back of your picture, it attaches at a point above the antenna and comes out to the ends of the antenna to hold it up, keep it aesthetically pleasing to be straight, and also uh, for mechanical reasons. So um, as has been observed, there are zoning ordinances that permit this. 8601 deals with setbacks and heights, and 7.1 deals with the exception to heights for uh, antennas such as I per, you know, produce, Pro yeah, propose, I'm sorry. Also, Section 8107, which is standards for specific uses, has a section for ground-mounted antennas. And as has been observed, they're not to exceed 75 feet. The instructions say use crank-up type, make it color-coordinated, harmonize with the background, put it in your backyard, adjacent to buildings, and of course, not on historical landmarks. And so I meet all of those standards. I thought this would not be nearly so difficult a process since I met all the standards. Oh, and I forgot to say, uh, commissioners, if you have any questions as we go, please feel free to, to interrupt me and ask. I would rather you satisfied your question and didn't have to try to remember it as we proceed. So I currently have a vertical antenna, and I try to use it. It's totally ineffective. It works OK for local communications, but I, I get maybe one or two states away. But I can't do transcontinental, and I cannot do intercontinental with it. I've been doing two-way radio for 50 years. I was licensed in 1977. I was a ham. I've been active ever since. When I lived in Tahunga, I had a 56-foot tall crank up and I had a, a horizontal Yagi on it, and I was not always, but frequently able to do intercontinental communications. So I knew that that sort of a configuration would be helpful. I have experience with it. And so this was when I was looking at buying this house, which the purpose of moving away from the water on Westlake Lake was to avoid the CCNRs. And by the way, uh, there are some re portions of Lynn Ranch that still have uh, CCNRs. I chose this section because it does not have CCNRs. Uh, that may answer the other thing that came up there. So um, based on uh, the works that's been done, a lower height will not be as effective and will not be able to accommodate my communications needs. That helps address the 40-foot questions, I hope. I have um, a question. Yes, sir. Um, so you have currently have an antenna, and yes. how high is it? It's about a 25-foot tall antenna, and its uh, base is about seven feet off the ground so that I don't poke my eye out with the radials that come out of it. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Yes, sir. Actually, a couple of them. Uh, thank you, K6WKW. This is a former KJ6ZY. Uh, and here are my questions. First of all, well, you had showed a nice diagram of what I believe is a four-band Yagi. A uh, four-element um, Yagi, yes, sir. So it covers 20, 15, 10, and 6-meter bands? Um, the, the diagram I show was generic. Um, often they cover 10 through 20, sometimes including the work bands, the, so that you get 12 and, and 17 meters. Um, but that's just a generic, uh, okay. Picture. Well, I'm just trying to figure out, I guess my basic question is what bands do you, um, more normally operate in? Well, um, 
I've never had a capability to work the 160 meter band, but I, I like to operate 80, 40, 20, 15, 10, and occasionally six. Six is a new capability with me. Okay, now in operating the 40 and 80 meter band, I'm assuming that you're planning to hang dipoles off of that uh, tower, is that correct? That's correct. That is the wire antenna that I had at the bottom of that one slide. Okay. And um, I'm assuming that you'll probably run one dipole that's um, um, that's tuned to cover both uh, 40 and 80. Is that correct? It could be a dipole. It could be an off-center fed instead. Okay. Then my next question is, uh, are you planning to hang a, a two meter to 20 or 440 antennas off this tower? I don't have any immediate plans to do that. And the county has been reluctant to, uh, didn't seem like they were very open-minded to any other structures. Um, I do not know, I, I don't have specific plans whether I might want to run hardline up this tower or not uh, to feed the HF, uh, or, you know, Yagi antenna. Okay. Um, but um, I did not, it, it would have been smart for me to apply for 75 foot height because I think the issues would have been just as difficult and I would have had uh, the capability of perhaps putting a two meter vertical or something like that at the top, but I have not presented that to the county. So that is not a part of my current proposal. Okay. However, however, if I, I would probably have to go back to the county to get permission, but if I were to put a cross arm at the top of the first section, it might be nice to be able to put a scanner antenna or a two meter antenna at that point. Okay. That's well, not you know, in, I was in trying I to feel you out to see what other things you might hang from that. And the reason I'm asking these questions, I'm not just trying to make conversation, is your reluctance to crank down the tower. Uh, and I can understand your reluctance being tied to time. You know, I operated a lot in the 20 and 15 meter bands. In the 20 meter band, I talked all the way around the world on uh, 100 watts or less. But um, what do I want to say? Well, I, I think I understand. Um, well, I, I guess, no, you did. You don't get to uh, just very my, well. the, the gist of my question is this. Uh, are there other things hanging on that tower that would preclude you from cranking it down when you're not using it? If I use a hard line, as you know, that is not very flexible. It's low loss, and that does not like to be bent back and forth frequently. Um, the wire dipole, if I crank the, the structure down, the wire di dipole would drop into the yard and probably become uh, I don't know what I could do to keep that from being a trip hazard. Yeah, um, I mean, that, that's kind of what I was thinking about and why you would be reluctant to move the tower up and down. Never well, the, the county also wanted me to do this essentially daily. I use my radio pretty much every day. Even last week when I was skiing, I accessed my radios remotely. I have that capability. So a daylight height thing would mean I have to crank it up and down every day. And besides the physical exertion that that involves, there are my neighbors. You know, these things don't have roller bearings. They don't go up and down silently. Uh, the one that I had when I was in Tahunga made quite a loud squealing noise as it was going up or down. And I don't want to have to do that to my neighbors every day. They're not going to appreciate an hour after sunset having this squealing noise that happens. So that was, that was part of it. And at the end of my, towards the end of my pr uh, presentation, I bring up the point that uh, actually the daylight height requirement is uh, uh, regulating the operation of my station. And Mr. King, you probably know that the FCC has full authority over frequency, power, operating hours, etc. So requiring me to have a different antenna height during daytime hours is actually infringing on FCC authority uh, in terms of the regulation of a station. 
Okay, well, I mean, I understand the case for your appeal, um, and I don't want to debate it here. I just sure. want in my making a decision to understand particularly where and how you operate and why you were so reluctant to um, raise and lower the tower um, because you, when you're not operating, you certainly don't need to be 65 feet in the air. Um, so I'm, I'll, you know, put that in my comments later, but I just wanted to understand how you plan to operate. Yes. Well, and operating during the day uh, will require that height also. As far as when I'm not operating, uh, I don't want that wire antenna to uh, drape into the yard and become a trip hazard for my wife, guests, or uh, it would also probably drape into my courtyard in the front, so delivery people would be at, at risk also. Yeah, Does that you. answer your question, Commissioner? Yes. Thank you. Um, so, although I have this experience uh, that I knew that this installation would be much more effective than my current on advice of counsel. I had a propagation study performed and that propagation study looked at my ability to communicate with South America, such as Brazil, Australia, and Japan. And that study shows that at 60, with a 65 foot structure, the antenna at 60 feet, I barely meet a 60% reliability, which is a target, a standard target for amateur radio. At 40 feet, I do not meet that requirement. Of course, if you would give me a permission to go to 85 or 95 feet, that would be great. Mr. Egan, who performed the study, by the way, talked to me about my desire to communicate with Europe. I would need a structure about 120 feet tall because of a local uh, hill that, that obscures me. And uh, he, Mr. Egan also commented on the very hilly terrain that's around me, as opposed to other areas. So as you know, this is an appeal. I know that it's sort of a de novo hearing, but I also, you know that the director issued a denial letter and the denial was based on view considerations, which as was pointed out from the 1999 clarification of the FCC, View considerations are not acceptable. And he also describes this as being out of character with the community. So um, addressing this for one thing, the county in, in, in crafting its zoning ordinance exceptions obviously knows that something 75 feet high is going to be visible in a residential area. Construction here is 25 feet or less usually. So the county must be expecting it to be seen. And so even though it will be seen, I don't see that you can say this is unexpected. Reasonable accommodation would require you to allow me to have this despite that aspect of it. Uh, I think we've probably talked about this, this allowance of views. And so uh, were you to deny me for view considerations, you're in violation of PRB1, and that does not provide reasonable accommodation. So regarding, let's see, I am now out of sync here, unfortunately. One of the conditions that the director has said I fail is uh, a finding must show that the proposed development is compatible with the character of surrounding legally established development. And the director was misinformed that there are no other similarly tall structures, man-made structures. About a half mile away, there is another amateur radio operator that has the almost identical plan. And on Lynn Road, just a short distance below Los Robles Hospital, there's still yet another one. And I think these things just blend in enough that people don't notice them. But if we look at the logic of the director's denial based on this thing, I have, I'm required to get approval in order to install this structure. But the director doesn't want to give me approval because there's nothing like it. And of course, there can't be anything like it if you don't give me approval. 
So you've created this logic, if this was, was valid, would create a catch-22. You can't have it because there's nothing like it there, and there's nothing like it there because you can't have it. And if that was valid, it would totally invalidate the zoning ordinances that provide these exceptions. I believe that circular illogic needs to be rejected. I contend that this condition is not valid as the director has found it. The next one is the proposed development would not be obnoxious or harmful or impair the utility of neighboring properties or uses. Well, it's like a tree, it's passive. It's not going to be obnoxious or harmful. So what if we look at utility and uses? This is a residential neighborhood. The uses and utility of these properties is that of a home. Home will always have some view, I'm sure, but that's not the purpose of a home. Purpose of a home is a place to live. So altering the neighbor's views by having my structure does not change the utility or use. Another finding is the proposed development would be, must not be detrimental to the public interest, health, safety, convenience, or welfare. So this as a potential source of emergency communications. And, and this kind of emergency communications really occurs at the time of greatest disruption and hence greatest need. So it's not all the time, but this is a potential source of communication, long range communication. When we have disruptions where maybe the airports and the roads are destroyed, how do you get word out? Well, this is a possible way. And it also is important to realize that you want redundancy in communication systems. The sheriff's station, East, East County Sheriff Station, has some capability of HF long-range communications. Should that site be destroyed for some reason, this would be a potential backup there. The redundancy is important. So it's in the public interest. And this is, it should not cause uh, inconvenience, this particular phrase. So what's an inconvenience, trouble, or difficulty to a personal requirements or comfort? So, well, nobody be inconvenienced because altering someone's view is not sufficient to be an inconvenience. If somebody wants a different colored roof, it alters their view. It doesn't require a CUP, but let's face it, it altering a view is not sufficient to be an inconvenience. And as was mentioned, California has a long-standing uh, common law. I've, I've, <laughs> I'm not an attorney, but I've done a lot of reading. There is no requirement in state law for maintaining a view. So I think that I've shown that uh, claims of, you know, again, I'm a little out of sync here. Uh, Warren, this is I'm, Bill. One, one, yes, one issue you might do is jump to slide 26. One of the neighbors, two of the neighbor concerns were supposedly about RF admissions, RF emissions rather, from the antenna being harmful to public health. And the FCC has done a study that says they're not. And so uh, that's that's something which I don't know we've gotten to it yet, but uh, it's it, it's it's slide 26 in the deck. <clears throat> and so um, you know the the the, the I know view, the one you're speaking of. Yeah, it's uh, I just right, have to find it. <laughs> there not, there it is. There. So a couple of the neighbors have raised like, you know, I'm going to die from ham radio. Uh, and, you know, they just don't know what they're talking about. And, and the FCC is, has studied this and, um, you know, completely eliminate any kind of emission concerns. So I think once the, once the view issue is, is, is uh, resolved and it can't be considered because that would be balancing, then you've got the technical issue, which the FCC has already addressed. And then Warren has uh, discussed the, the, the need based upon the, Egan's, the Egan uh, study. So we're back down to the reasonable accommodation of 65 feet. And I think the only conclusion that follows from that is that the, the uh, uh, CUP should be granted. Anyway, but I want to interrupt, but since you were in 
that section, Warren, uh, might be good just to jump ahead to that. Right. I had one more thing I was going to address uh, regarding existing and potential land uses. So I will. So that was the uh, other thing, the last of the four conditions. The proposed development, if allowed by a conditional use permit, is compatible with the existing and potential land uses in the general area where the development is located. So whether somebody else has already installed one of these or not is really not a, not a disqualifying or qualifying issue. What are the potential land uses here? According to your matrix in section five of the zoning ordinances, it says this is one of the potential uh, uses. So I don't understand how the, the director could argue incompatibility because it's not compatible with the potential land uses here. So as my attorney has pointed out, uh, view issues are not relevant. I think I've shown that the incompatible character aspects are incorrect. I was going to go through some of these things. I was going to tell you some things about PRB1, which was established in 1985. It calls for reasonable accommodation, minimum practicable regulation. I don't think <laughs> I have to beat this too much to death. But here are extractions from it. It says they, they recognize that antenna height is very important to communication effectiveness. This is the theme that occurs through this law and through other laws repeatedly. Accommodate reasonably amateur communications, minimum practicable regulation, cannot preclude uh, radio operation. FCC put it into the Code of Federal Regulations, Section 97, Part 97, is that which regulates my operation but also binds other people too. Same words, you can see that. The California Government Code, 65850.3, here are the words again. So California has adopted this in its law. So these, these are our key things that we need to focus on. There are also court cases. I mean, we, we're not all attorneys, obviously. So this balancing of interests, we've spoken of that. I was going to originally bring this in here. I think you've heard that quite well from the... Uh, initial statements and the discussions. This case of Bodoni versus the incorporated village of Sands Point, the judge ruled that if you, uh, in, you preclude operations, if you seriously interfere with the full enjoyment of my operation of my amateur station. So I need that 65 feet trying to limit me to 40 feet, I believe would violate this judgment. Pentel versus the city of Mendota, that using, requiring me to use an inadequate antenna does not constitute an accommodation in any practical sense. So if views are not an issue to be considered, balancing cannot occur. I need the permissible height. This, I'm within your zoning ordinances and trying to do the daylight height is not appropriate. State law mirrors federal law. I'm just, I think, just repeating this and probably boring you. Um, I believe I should be permitted. This is the slide that we just looked at regarding RF uh, safety. And by the way, I am required to do a station evaluation regarding RF safety, both for my own safety and the safety of other people. It's included in my information packet that you have. It's a large packet, but it shows that with this antenna, I will be completely safe. If I do the worst possible things, use full power, transmit constantly, over-process my voice, I will still be safe. My neighbors will not be exposed to excessive RF. Um, thank you, uh, the gentleman who mentioned that uh, about the exemption from the CEQA. 
at the beginning of the CUP process, my proposal with a 55 foot tall structure and the 10 foot on top was found to be appealing and what was what they call it a categorically exempt. And I mentioned it here because I'd rather not pay for the county to do work that they've already done. You charge me for that. I'm $6,000 into this process and 11 months so far. The remainder of my presentation deals with the conditions of approval. Um, I don't know if this has gone a long in time. I don't know if you'd like to take a break or if you'd like to consider the prime question or if you'd like to uh, have me continue. I certainly don't expect the commissioners to do wordsmithing and uh, determine it, but I, would, I do want to point out some of these conditions of approval that are overreaching and improper. Uh, Mr. Chafee is a, uh, a man very well familiar with wireless communication facilities. Mr. He drew upon Mr. the Mr. standards. Yes, sir. Uh, you have 15 minutes. We have to take a break at 1115. Would you like me to continue or would you like to take a, a break at this time? No, continue for the next 14 minutes. Then we'll. All right. Take All right, sir. Thank you. Um, so, as uh, uh, Ms. Fogg said, we really haven't completed a satisfactory set of conditions of approval. There was discussion. The county, in their operations with me, did not consider minimum practicable regulation. Um, so, I will bring these things up, uh, except number one is just an administrative item. The original COAs were from wireless communication facilities. How do I know that? Well, not only by their nature, but <laughs> they hadn't sanitized the words wireless communication facility was still in the text. The ordinances specifically state that uh, an amateur station is exempt from all wireless communication facility uh, considerations. So, uh, and as I mentioned, the daylight height restriction would be controlling my station operation. That would be inappropriate. That is not in what I believe the county may have provided you with for the uh, pending COAs. Uh, in the 1999 PRB1, the FCC did mention conditions as also requiring minimal practical regulation. And then in 2000, they did further clarification and they say, an amateur may apprise a zoning authority that a condition is more than minimum regulation and therefore impracticable to comply with. So I believe I have a legal standing to bring these issues to your attention. Okay, um, condition of approval number two. Let me find my notes here. Sorry for this delay. We did get through quite a few peaches here. So condition two is listed as saying, to ensure that the facility is maintained in a neat and orderly manner, so as not to create any hazardous conditions or unsightly conditions which are visible from outside of the project site. My project is about one and a half square feet. I don't understand how this is a legitimate uh, process. The, the uh, proposal here, this uh, item number two, references section 8114-3. And when I look at that, you already have the right to monitor inspect. I don't see why you would need to have it repeated here. So I would say that COA2 should be removed. Reporting of major incidents to ensure that the planning director is notified of major incidents associated with or resulting from the project. So oil operations and mining reclamation require, in the zoning ordinance, require reporting of major incidents. The only major incident I can think of is an earthquake, and you'd already be aware of that. I don't think you need me. I can't see that this is a legitimate either. I believe it's part of wireless communication facility 
requirements. The county states that I applied for a 10 year permit for the CUP. If you were to look at my original documents, I did not ask for a time limit on it. So that's something that the county has inserted. Now, there's a risk to me if I were to forget and not renew this after 10 years, which is certainly possible, then I'd have to go through all of this again. My construction requires a foundation uh, in the ground, underground, five foot by five foot, seven foot, three inches deep to be filled with concrete with a wire reinforcing cage, seven cubic yards of uh, concrete. It doesn't seem appropriate to give me just a 10 year time limit. I expect to be here the rest of my life. The county has conditions later on in the COAs that say, if you abandon it, if you stop using it, you need to take it out. So I don't see what the 10 year does. Um, and I don't know whether it's required by a, a conditional use permit, but suppose I was going to build an oversized garage and I needed a, a CUP to do that. So I'm going to pour a foundation. I'm going to build a structure. I somehow don't feel like the county would issue a 10 year permit for a oversized garage. This should not have, I should not have a time limit. I don't know. I just, sometimes I feel like there are biases against the uh, antenna project. Uh, COA 5B requires a $500 deposit. That's an additional financial burden. That deposit is not returned until I take the structure out. That means I'm going to die. I'm never going to get that deposit returned. So I don't need the. They also reference that section 8114 again does not require advanced deposits. Although it is mentioned for oil development, commercial organics processing, overlay and special purpose zones, and temporary sign removal. I'm not any of these things. I think these are commercial things. Nine requires de defense and indemnification. And that does occur in the zoning ordinance for rental units, wheeled conveyance, and parking agreements. So I did ask the county to remove that. You know, I was, I, some of the county's re replies are, there's nothing in the VC, uh, nothing in the zoning ordinance that doesn't allow us to put these in. Well, there uh, Warren, is. Warren, a... Warren, this is Bill. Let me have one other comment on the defense issue. Yes. Obviously, this this condition can't be imposed if this thing proceeds um, further on down the, the the legal line, so to speak, to superior court. Uh, you can't put the applicant in a position of defending uh, the city if suit is brought against the city to you know reverse what we would consider an inappropriate denial of the CUP. So this. This def defense and indemnification uh, really doesn't fit, you know, anywhere, and it's just just a burden uh, that I think is unnecessary as a matter of law that's imposed on the applicant. Sorry, Warren. No, as usual, you put things more succinctly than I do. <laughs> it's okay. All right. Um, and number ten, the second paragraph, dealing with illegal wording, I. I'm fine with the portion of the paragraph that says if the court finds the wording to be illegal and the county can recraft it so that they meet their requirements, um, that's fine. But a portion of this says if it, uh, one, of, one of the COAs is illegal and you can't recraft it to meet your, your goals, you must be doing something really illegal. So you can cancel my CUP. I don't want you to cancel my CUP. I think that that portion of the wording should be removed. <sighs> Number 13 requires 24 hour a day, 365 day a year telephone access to me. That's great for Verizon. I think US mail would be sufficient. I just ask that you can have contact with me, no problem, but it should be reasonable. Then as far as the COA number one, um, there are some wordings. They, they say non-commercial ham radio antenna 
consisting of, and it should be antenna support structure, because that's what you're authorizing. They changed my original wording to be a mast antenna instead of an antenna mast. The 10-foot section on top is not an antenna. It's simply a mast. And then uh, I think there should be some additional wording to allow non-commercial antennas for use with my ham station, including my directional Yagi antenna. Uh, Commissioner King? Yeah, I'm going to have to ask for that uh... Um, recess now. Okay. We will recess until 1135 or until you come back. Well, let's make it till I come back. I'll, I'll try and get back as soon as I can. Okay. We will recess until Commissioner King can return. Thank you for your time. And that was the end of the presentation.
I still think I'll try because you also get your attention. And GE never answers. It's the expedite question when you can be asked. Maybe not helpful when you are arrived at the point. Is it helpful to you? Travel is now in the fantasy section. Sci fi in current affairs and
heat back. Can everybody hear me? Yes, sir. Great, thank you. I'm back, Earl. Sorry, the doctor took took too long. Well, that's okay. Uh, is everybody back? The director Ward is back. I am. I am back. Also, trying. Commissioner Ward is back. Commissioner Boyston is back. Just make sure. Looks like we got yes, Thomas and Mindy. And do we have Mr. Wigger? Oh, yes, there he is. Good. We got him. We need Commissioner Idukas. And then we can proceed. Earl, it's been so long you've changed clothes. Yeah. No, I just put a jacket on. <laughs> The room I'm in, for some reason, is the coolest room in the house, or I should say the coldest room in the house. Yeah. All right. Well, we are broadcasting, so as soon as we get uh, Commissioner Dukas, we'll be ready to go. Okay. And thank you, everybody, for indulging me. I, I really appreciate it. No problem. Certainly. There were likely other people that needed to take a break also. <laughs> Well, probably not as long as I had to take. Uh, Mr. Wigginer, I'm pronouncing it wrong. I apologize again. Yes, sir. But, uh, when Commissioner Idukas comes back and we reconvene, uh, I'll give you five more minutes to conclude your presentation, if that's okay. Thank you very much. Let me see if I can reach Nora. Director Ward, do you think we need to call Nora? Uh, yes, uh, Chair McVale, I'm trying to do that right now. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Dukas is going to be with us in just a moment. Thank you. Thank you, Director Ward. There she is. There she is. Miss America. <laughs> uh, Secretary Rodusco, are we ready to reconvene? Yes, we're all present and ready. OK. Uh, I'll reconvene the Planning Commission meeting. Uh, Mr. Wigginer, you have five minutes to conclude your presentation. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, it occurs to me that I should mention that the uh, 
the bands that I intend to operate include the 10 and 15, 10, 15 and 20 meter bands, which are fundamentally uh, daytime operating frequencies. This is because of the ionosphere and the physics of the solar interaction with the ionosphere. And then I will also share screen just one other thing I wanted to bring to your attention. See if I can do this. Hopefully you can see this. Uh, I provided a large informational packet. And in that packet, this is page four. And on page five is a similar diagram. These are the propagation predictions produced by Mr. Egan. And these show propagation to different parts of the world on the 20 meter band. And this shows that I'm just reaching that 60% reliability, meaning six out of 10 days, I should be able to reach these areas. So this is my need to have my antenna at 60 feet. This is just barely meeting my needs. And I would love to have applied for a taller antenna, but the next commercial structure would reach 73 feet. And by the time I put the antenna above that and have that yoke that I mentioned, I'm going to exceed the 75 foot limit. So I chose this more modest uh, application. This is my reasoning for doing that. I'd love to have more. Um, uh, Chairman, I think that's all I have. Uh, uh, Mr. Robinson, do you think of anything else that perhaps should be added at this time? Let me stop. No, I mean, only, only to just simply reemphasize that um, the statutory requirements of a reasonable accommodation of the need, and uh, Warren has demonstrated technologically what the need is, and therefore, I believe as a matter of law, the Planning Commission must using the federal statute language or shall using the California's comparable statute accommodate this. And as I've said, I don't want to repeat it. Balancing is not part of that. So um, I think um, I think we're done, Warren. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Got, got a little techie, a little law, but that's what we get into with these antenna battles. I'm an engineer, folks. I'm sorry. I was this way at three years old. My parents' alarm clock was completely dismantled, and it was still plugged in, well, and I lived. Well, hopefully, hopefully the non-engineers, uh, you know, get it too, and uh, that's what we tried to do today, kind of simplify it for everybody and get it down to the fundamental issues. But, you know, you know th we thank you for your attention. Okay. Uh, Secretary Verdusco, do we have anybody on Zoom or the telephone that would be in opposition, would like to speak in opposition. Uh, so I have a few public comments by email and um, a, mo the majority of the public comments by email are also uh, registered to speak. Uh, so I asked Director Ward for some guidance on that and I, it looks like um, it's gonna be one or the other. Either I read the the public comment or you get your turn to speak. Uh, yes. So at this time, are you requesting uh, only speakers or did you want the, uh, the I would no start comments with the, as well? Um, I would start with the, I recommend you start with the, the public speakers. Public speakers. Um, and if we get through those and those are the same individuals as the emails we've received, then they've provided their comment uh, directly to the commission through their verbal presentation. Thank you. Okay, so my first public speaker is Amber Erdman. Ms. Erdman. And she is on the Zoom call. She's just, uh, she's muted and has her mic, I mean, her camera off. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, but your video is off. Let's see, is that better? There you are. Okay. Hi. I'd like to start off by saying thank you for taking the time to listen and hear our concerns regarding the CUP over at 2065 Kayaka. As a nearby neighbor, 
I can see Mr. Warren's property from my window right here. I respectfully request that the commission uphold the decision made by the County of Ventura and deny the CUP for 2065 Cayeca. Here are the reasons why. Number one, a 65 foot antenna as previously stated does not meet the characteristics of the Loon Ranch neighborhood. This is an equestrian community. That is what we have been built upon. Lynn Ranch has beautiful views, especially this side of Lynn Ranch. There are mostly one story homes on this side of Lynn Ranch. We are located on half acres. Our poles are all underground over here. There is a one street light at our corner and it was designed like that so that we can enjoy the night skies. Putting a 65 foot tower across the street from me is going to severely impact the characteristics of this neighborhood. In this neighborhood, just to paint a picture of what it looks like down here, we see neighbors walking together. We see neighbors constantly walking their dogs, running, even on horseback. We've even seen the occasional neighbor walking their goat. That is the type of community that is over here. We do not have industrial machinery when you look out and enjoy the beautiful scenery here. We are just a few houses down from a trail that is commonly used by many of the residents here within Lynn Ranch. This trail is beautiful. It takes you to the scenic areas and it is gorgeous. If this tower is put here across the street from me, it is going to be the tallest structure here in Lynn Ranch. Now, I understand that Mr. Warren has talked about, you know, there's another tower half mile away and all, and I'm pretty sure I, I know which one he's talking about, but that one is very different from the tower that he is trying to put in here. His location sits below with all of the other houses surrounding him. Therefore, all of these other houses look down upon his property. The other house that he's referring to is in a cul-de-sac and the antenna is placed near a hillside. So it is, you can't really see it if you were a neighbor down the street. Where here, you will see it visually everywhere. Um, I also do want to point out that here in Lynn Ranch, we do have a community school down the street from us with about 400 K through five children who attend that school. And I do want to please raise some concerns as a mother of three children to the environmental impact that this tower across the street may cause for that school and our children here. Sorry, there's been a lot, let's see. At 2065 Kayaka, it is a single story home. So it roughly is about 15 feet high. This antenna being 65 feet is going to be extremely visible around the whole entire house. There's going to be remaining 50 feet of antenna that is going to be visible from every direction. Let's see. Warren's property also, I would like to point out, is surrounded completely by houses. He does not back up to open space like some of our neighbors do here. So his property is very visible here in the community. Not only is this antenna going to be visible, but based upon the previous comments by Warren and some of the exhibits that he entered. Um, I have news concerns now in regards to how loud this new machinery across the street may become. Mr. Warren said that he's not going to raise and lower it because it's going to be loud. However, he's going to be using it day and night. My question is, what if he decides to start raising and lowering it? How much noise and inconvenience and obnoxious is that going to be for the community around here? 
best case scenario, if he leaves his antenna up the whole entire time, it still has, if from my understanding, based on the exhibit that has been presented in uh, exhibit eight, I believe it was, it's going to rotate and it needs to be directional in order for him to communicate with people across the country on different continents. That constant rotating is going to cause noise day in and day night and day out. I do not want to listen and hear this noise. I find it obnoxious to listen and hear noise of a machine making. Not okay with that. He also states that this is going to have a turning radius of about 25 feet. I don't know how a turning radius of 25 feet is going to be quiet. According to another report that he submitted the showing the need for the height for his radio antenna, he states that the higher the FH antenna, the lower the angle of radiation. I would like people to note that the way that our houses sit here is we are on a hillside. His sits lower than my house across the street. With a tower in the air, we are going to be closer is my understanding. That is a major concern for my family and I. I have also reviewed the study that was mentioned previously about the, um, what is it, the, the um, RFI provided by Mr. Winger. And I would like to go ahead and state that I still have concerns for my family. Look real quick. I have concerns about him adding and making adjustments and modifications to this antenna. I have concerns about the noise that it might cause, um, the health and safety for my family across the street. I also have some major concerns when it comes to the weather we have here in Lynn Ranch. Having a tower across the street in the winds, which it's very windy today, we have a wind advisory. I'm concerned about things blowing over, getting caught in it, how Mr. Warren has now talked about it going up and down and things becoming hazardous because of the wires that will be, well, that, that will reach the front of his house, even though this is positioned behind his house. I'm trying to take it all in. Those are some major concerns that I have for my family living across the street. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to us and hear our concerns. And I respectfully request that the commission uphold this decision made by the County of Ventura Planning Division and deny the CUP across the street. Thank you, Ms. Erkman. Any questions from the commission? Hearing none. The next next speaker, please. Okay, so the next speaker I have registered is Aman Matsuda. Hello, can everyone hear me? Yes, go ahead. Thank you for allowing me to join. <clears throat> my name is Amin Matsuda. My family and I live at 1329 Camino Cristobal, just a few lots up the hill from Mr. Weger's property. I've publicly commented on this matter previously, and I do so again today with no desire to hide or anonymize my identity for the record. A few quick comments in response to some of the previous statements during the session. In my review, the FCC is not attempting to enable long range radio communication, rather simply the ability of a citizen to operate radio communication generally. A 40 foot structure enables Mr. Weger to operate in this way. He indicated such using his current antenna, saying that he already uses it almost every day, including while in a remote position. So clearly having an antenna in our neighborhood next to his house 
is not a requirement for him to be able to leverage radio communication. As well, the ability to communicate intercontinentally is not a provision of FCC regulations. Likewise, there is no federal, state, or local regulation, according to my understanding, that requires Mr. Wegerer to live where he does. He chose to live in an area surrounded by hills, which, according to his previous statements, make it difficult to conduct long-distance communication. If long-distance communication were his primary requirement, there are other neighborhoods and even cities whose landscapes are more conducive to his hobby. He chose to live in this neighborhood with a certain character. That said, my role is not to defend the county's existing decision to deny the permit or to defend the legal provisions currently in place for arriving at such decisions. My role is also not to dispute Mr. Wegger's passion about his hobby or why he wants to communicate intercontinentally. Rather, I'm simply grateful for the opportunity to provide a statement reflecting my position and the position of my family on his request. And I believe the invitation for the public to comment is validation enough that our comments must be considered, speaking to the comments before about balancing and considering other points of view. I've specifically organized my comments today around the NCZO standards that must be met in order for a conditional use permit to be granted. Regarding standard number two, which relates to the compatibility with character of surrounding legally established development and standard five, which regards compatibility with existing and potential land uses. The proposed obstruction would create an industrial and commercial feel to our residential community. The current character does not include large, tall metal equipment that dominates the neighborhood. The antenna does not harmonize with the background, either in color or form, with the background currently including green trees, brown hills, and blue sky. As was previously stated, it would become the tallest structure in our neighborhood, originating at the same elevation as other tall things such as the palm trees and even surpassing other trees that actually start at higher elevations. This sets a precedent that would allow such antennas to be placed on all Lynn Ranch lots. And that certainly is not the character of this neighborhood, which is valued for its views in almost every direction and enjoyment of nature with trails nearby. Regarding standard number three, which relates to a request uh, to not be obnoxious, harmful, or impairing of the utility of neighboring property and uses. The height of the antenna would put it in direct line of sight from my west facing viewing patio and rear windows and those of other neighbors as well. The view of the horizon would become obstructed by a non natural structure rising above house lines and the tallest vegetation in the area disrupting the skyline view punctuated with pleasant trees, hedges, and distant hills. To Mr. Weger's earlier point, utility of a home is in the eye of the person who lives there, and utility is more than just living. Mr. Weger himself discussed the disruption caused to the enjoyment of a sunset caused by irritating sounds. Enjoyment of such a sunset would no longer be enjoyable with the disruption caused by an eyesore structure in the way preventing me from even wanting to look out my window. The existence of the antenna would irreversibly reduce the value of my property and remove what has been a key selling point of my and other Lynn Ranch properties, especially those in our end of the neighborhood. We purchased this property and at a price commensurate with the view. And real estate is recognized federally as a place to hold investment value and therefore value of a property is part of the utility definition. The strength of seasonal winds could also destabilize the antenna structure, putting other properties at risk of damage. Finally, regarding standard number four, which speaks to uh, a, a piece of equipment not being detrimental to the public interest or welfare. Since the request is for a privately used antenna, there would be no positive impact on public interest, health, safety, convenience, and welfare from the structure. Despite claims that this provides a backup form of communication, the only person authorized or equipped to operate it would be Mr. Weger himself with no obligation to surrounding neighbors. Instead, the only impact would be extremely negative. Even so, I believe the standard for acceptance rests not on whether there's a positive impact on these items, 
only if there would not be a negative detrimental impact. And I believe there absolutely would be. The antenna is also not required to maintain a generally accepted standard of living. However, it would decrease my standard of living directly, both in terms of the use of my property and its valuation. In closing comments during the original hearing, the requester disputed what neighbors said about the 65 foot antenna and how it would affect them personally. He even said that we would get used to it and it would blend in. And he used those words again today. It is not his place to dispute what others think or how we feel. I am not disputing his feelings about the antenna's impact on him. I am directly confirming the negative, obnoxious, detrimental impact that it will have on me and my family and the use of our property. And others have confirmed the same, including my previous neighbor who just spoke. Based on these points, I respectfully request that the county uphold the previous decision to deny the conditional use permit and help us maintain the character, the intent, and the public interest of this part of the Lynn Ranch neighborhood. I'll end with a picture if I can set up my screen share to show you uh, what I believe this would look like um, from my backyard. Now, I didn't measure this or do any kind of study uh, directly with equipment, but based on the height of the adjacent palm trees, a 65 foot antenna would look something like this. And this is what would become the nature of our end of the neighborhood. Thank you, Mr. Maxuda. Any questions from the commission? Commissioner Aducas? Um, has um, county staff had a chance to look at that, um, that last photo? And um, is, that, is that already in the, in the record somewhere? Commissioner Dukas, through the chair, uh, that particular photo uh, has not been sent to us yet, and so we would appreciate having that for the record. However, Mr. Matsuda did share a similar photo at the September 2nd hearing. Thank you. Any other questions? So, so are we going to get it? Are we going to get that? I'll be yeah. happy to share it. I'll send it directly to Mindy and Thomas. Thank you. Commissioner King. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Mr. Matsuda, simple question. Why did you choose to um, make your simulated tower red? Just to make it easy to see. Okay, because you realize that the tower won't be red. Of course. Okay. And your, and your case is basically, the biggest part of your case is it's going to be ugly. And it's going to reduce the value of my property because other people find it ugly too. I just, I, you know, want to get you on the record explaining why your, uh, your tower was in red. It was, I knew that it would be up for only a few seconds and it would be the easiest thing to spot. Part of my professional job is to develop communications that are easy to absorb within 10 seconds. Red is the best color for doing that. Okay. I, I got to say... You're an excellent communicator. <laughs> I, I heard you loud and clear. Thank you. Any other questions? Hearing none, next speaker, please. Okay, so the next speaker that I have registered is Kara Matsuda. I, is she still here? I don't see her name in the queue. Okay, yes, she's not on the Zoom. Um, are we gonna give her a little bit of time or should we move on to the next speaker? Let's move I, on. I, yes, yeah, she had to leave. I've confirmed that she had to leave. Okay. And so the next speaker registered, um, is Kate Gregory? I don't see a Kate Gregory. I think that was the last speaker on this item. Uh, yes. So Kate Gregory also sent in a public comment. So I can I can read that one. Okay. 
Uh, Secretary Redusco, why don't you read the emails that you received or written comments? Hopefully 250 words or less. Okay, so the first one I received is from a Jessica Boyd, and it reads, to whom it may concern, we live near the intended ham radio property on Calle Salto and strongly opposed to it being installed. One of the reasons we chose to live in this part of Lynn Ranch was because all the power and electrical lines are constructed underground to preserve each property's view. From our properties to at least a mile away, we do not have power lines. Installing a high tower like the plans like the plan show will stand out and literally impact property values, not to mention setting a precedent for anyone else wanting to install in this small community. It was mentioned previously that it was for emergencies and I strongly disagree that it will be useful. Our properties are next to an open canyon and considered a high fire zone. The strongest likelihood of natural disaster for us is a fire. And if that's the case, the best outcome would be to vacate the area, not communicate it through a ham radio. I plead for those making this final decision to drive by and look at the properties and community that will be directly impacted for years to come if this, is, if this does get approved. I'd also like to mention that there are several neighbors that weren't notified of this meeting who strongly opposed to ham radio when their view will be directly impacted. Thank you for everyone's time and appreciate the opportunity to voice our concerns. Next. Okay, the next is from Amber Erdman, but she already got a chance to speak. So I'm moving on to Catherine Gregory. Go ahead. I have two uh, from Catherine Gregory. Let's see, hopefully they're less than 250 words. Okay, so it looks like this one was sent in by Catherine Gregory. However, it is uh, written, um, it, it looks like it's on behalf of uh, Letty Elias. Uh, I'm not sure if that's allowed. Uh, yes, you, Mr. Barn, you read in the, the email comment. I'm sorry. Yes, you can read that one. We'll attribute okay. that to Let Letty. Um, Elias. Know. Elias, thank you. Okay, so it reads, my name is Letty Elias and I have lived in Lynn Ranch on Calle Sequoia for 27 years. I love this wonderful neighborhood. I know there have been many unique uses of our individual properties over the years. We have had to choose to not agree on some of those uses to protect the intended ranch feel. This is not to include commercial characteristics. I feel that ham radio antenna height of 75 feet and 10 foot mast is very commercial. I feel that views will be compromised and will not like one for, I also feel that views will be compromised and would not like one for my property to look over during a beautiful sunset. I liked it better when the conversations were over a noisy rooster. Thank you for the opportunity to share my thoughts. Next. Are there any others? Yes, it, it, I'm pulling up the PDF. They were sent in in PDF format. Okay, sorry. No, no, you're fine. So the next one is It was sent in by Captain Gregory on her own behalf. It reads, Dear Mr. Chaffee, I am responding to the appeal of the previously denied permit requested by Mr. Warren Wer Werger at 2065 Calle Yucca, Lynn Ranch, Thousand Oaks. I have new concerns in two areas. One, during the previous meeting, Mr. Werger mentioned that there would be no radio wave interference to be concerned about, and he is now stating the reason for the higher antenna is to lessen the chance of interference. I would like to point out that I have not received any documentation from the city or Mr. Werger to help ease my mind. I also question the requirement in section 
8107-1.1 about adequate screening of the tower or structure from view. Has a landscape plan been submitted for review along with the appeal request? I understand and appreciate that a requesting party has the right to appeal a decision made by the county, but the same set of circumstances still apply as noted. Residential neighborhood rural feel, property size and location of the excessive antenna, impaired views of surrounding homes. I purchased my home in 2015 exclusively for the view. Once a natural view is lost, is lost in, will not return, and hence beauty and property values lost. I feel this antenna for a hobby of Mr. Werger is pursuing at the cost of at the cost to neighbors is unreasonable. Thank you, Captain Gregory. The next public comment uh, was sent in by Andy Davis, and it reads, to the committee, I am unable to attend the meeting related to case PL21-0047, non-commercial ham radio CUP appeal hearing due to work obligations. This case is in relation to a neighbor at 2065 Calle Yucca who has applied for a conditional use permit for a greater than 55-foot non-commercial commercial ham radio tower with 10 foot mass greater than 65 feet in total as stated previously and reiterated today it is my strong belief and that of many others in in this neighborhood that this project should not be allowed to proceed as previously communicated i believe there is evidence to suggest a ham radio tower like that proposed could have health consequ consequences for humans and in particular for children Based on a review of studies published up until 2011, the International Agency for Research of Cancer has classified radiation from towers, such as this, as possibly carcinogenic to humans. Although this remains an area of debate, it will not be prudent to allow such a tower in a residential neighborhood with considerable numbers of children. In fact, a newborn baby recently arrived in the house across the street from 2065 Calle Yucca, and I am particularly concerned with unknown effects on very young children. Second, there is no necessary use for a ham radio tower this size, indulging, in, indulging an amateur ham radio operator to communicate with other operators around the world instead of simply using the internet is absolutely frivolous. We have modern tools like mobile phones and voice over IP, which can accomplish the goal of communication without impeding on health and sightline of neighbors. Lastly, a tower that rises nearly 50 feet above the ground above the roofline of a neighboring house will be a visible blight on the neighborhood and consequently depress home prices in the charming Thousand Oaks neighborhood. Lynn Ranch is a unique and charming part of Thousand Oaks. Although the homeowner reference other ham radio towers exist in Thousand Oaks, none of these should be considered even re remotely comparable to this situation. The towers called out in his appeal are in vastly different contextual situations that would be obvious to any observer. This particular metal monstrosity would rise well above any other structure in the neighborhood and would actually site, sit square in the middle of the community. No homeowner will be able to avoid its constant presence. A single homeowner should not be allowed to introduce such an eyesore that negatively impacts the value of others, other homes in the area. We know this would never be acceptable in any neighborhood that has covenants, conditions, and restrictions in Thousand Oaks. Thank you for your consideration. I stand ready to discuss this topic in more detail if you choose. The next uh, public comment was sent in by Sam Cole and it reads, sir and madam, I am a 30 year old resident of Lynn Ranch. We have always been a quiet, close knit residential community with the exception of an auto junkyard that we are sure attracts rodents we have all taken pride in our homes and the surrounding areas with the exception of, sorry, now with one neighbor's desire to erect a 60 foot ham radio tower, it is time to, it is time we join together to stop it. It will not only be an eyesore, but we are a high wind area and that would be a danger to surrounding homes and neighbors. Before moving here, I lived in Agora Hills where a neighbor put up a tower. It had adverse effects on our TV and radio reception. It took us a while to force its removal. There is no need to put our neighborhood through that here in Lynn Ranch. The council has denied the request once, and there is no need to change your decision now. We, Lynn Ranch neighbors, thank you in advance for your kind consideration in this matter. Sam and Shelby Cole.
Okay, and the final public comment uh, was sent in by Tricia Lethko. And it reads, I am a neighbor of the person at 2065 Calle Yucca. I oppose this permit for this person to put up a 55 foot three section lattice tower. I have many concerns about this. One of my concerns, and I believe it is the same with many neighbors, is that is the fact that this tower will ruin the landscape of this area. These homes in this part of Lynn Ranch were originally designated as the view area, highlighted by the fact that we do not even have above ground telephone poles and wires. This was to enhance the view of this very rural area, and this is why many people bought in this particular area. Allowing this tower to go in will block and or impede the view for many homes. Many neighbors have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars landscaping their yards to enhance whatever view they have of this natural beauty. This will ruin, th this, will ruin this for all of us. Additionally, there is a debatable safety of such a tower, RF, EME, emission, ongoing research. Many of us are investing hundreds of thousands into our overall health only to be living next something that is potentially harmful without our permission and without us having weighed the risk and decided to take that risk. Instead, it could impose that risk on, all, on us. Another concern is safety during windstorms of which we have had many in the last few years. In fact, it has bent metal even lifted an extremely heavy vintage glass outdoor table, flipped it up and over smashing glass all over the yard. Extremely powerful winds and a 55 foot tower in the middle of a neighborhood could be a huge liability. As a final note, I don't understand how one person's hobby can be permitted to affect and be imposed in the, on the lives of so many other people. Okay, okay. thank and you. And I'm sorry, uh, I actually have uh, Kara's, Kara Matsuda, she was registered to speak and I have uh, two public comments uh, that she sent in uh, not too long ago. Uh, the first one reads, I am writing to inform you of my strong opposition to the 2065 Calle Yucca Ham Radio Facility Appeal. The county's commercial and industrial permitting planners got it right when they denied the initial request, allowing a 60-foot tower to be constructed in our section of Lynn Ranch would not only negative, negatively affect the value and enjoyment of the premium lot we invested in, but it would be det detrimental to the identity of the neighborhood as a whole. Our section of Lynn Ranch is known for unobstructed views. Should one large tower be allowed, it could be used as a president for more to be built in the future. Thank you for your consideration, Kara Matsuda. Okay. The second one uh, is also by Kara Matsuda. It is a little bit longer. Um, let me know if I should continue. Is it virtually the same thing? Uh, more or less, it, it has a couple more points. Read the, read the couple of different points. Let's see. So the first point uh, being made kind of goes hand in hand with the previous email about the property values. However, it's uh, it's written a little bit differently where it's um, explaining how it, uh, I'll just read it. So Warren statements about the proposed tower not changing the neighborhood are not accurate. He stated that it is a taller ham radio, that there is a taller ham radio tower a half mile away. Also a half mile away are visible electrical and telephone lines, as well as more frequent street lamps. Our portion of the neighborhood borders open space. We have no visible power or phone lines and, and very limited street lamps. Thus, his 65-foot tower would not be in keeping with the current surroundings. The tower he referenced on Lynn Road is on a corner property next to street lamps and traffic lights, hence why it is likely approved. And then uh, the other point that was added in, uh, while I respect Warren's federal protection of guaranteed rights to ham radio access, there was no evidence given as to guarantee right of range.
Thank you, Renee. I think we, we probably at this point reach the 250 word uh, comments. Yeah, and the last two, just reiterating what was uh, mentioned in the last public comment. Okay. Thank you, Secretary Verduzco. Uh, I will give the appellant 10 minutes for rebuttal. Uh, Mr. McPhail, let, yeah, let me take a couple minutes of that with the following. Every comment you've heard so far focuses on a view. Uh, your, your lawyers can verify this. I'm just gonna read a statement from the case Miramar Mobile County versus City of Oceanside, 119 Cal App 4th, 477, which says, California landowners do not have a right of access to air, light, and view over adjoining property. That's well-established law. I'm sure you're fully aware of it. If that's the case, they don't have a right to object on the basis of the view. And, it can, and as we've said earlier, to balance uh, which is improper on the basis of a view is improper. Ms. Erdman raised, and I've got one of these antennas, the, the concept of noise. Uh, you don't hear a rotor turning an antenna 65 feet in the air. And my antenna is motorized, which goes up and down without cranking. It's virtually silent. So there are no, there are no noise considerations. I mean, there, she's more than willing to put up with cars driving by her house. But uh, the notion that this is going to be a noisy structure is, is, is just without basis. Um, as far as the weather and wind and some of that, um, my, my tower, uh, I'm sure, and these are all commercially available towers, um, is certified for 100 mile an hour wind. And I live right along the coast here in Manhattan Beach, and it can blow 50 miles an hour. And uh, my antenna is not guide or anything else, and it's solid as a rock. Similarly, commercial Yaggies are certified for very, very high wind loading. So the, the notion that something's going to blow over or it's going to be some kind of disaster is simply, again, it's, it's just pretextual and without any, any technical basis, much like the view concerns are without any legal basis. And I'll leave the rest to Warren. If he's there, Warren? I am here. All right. I am here. Turn. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I got to, I won't try to respond to each individual thing that'll take forever. On the topic of physical safety, as Mr. Robinson says, uh, that structure is safe. I gave you in the uh, information packet, a table showing what I think I will have for wind load. The highest wind I've measured in a year and a half is 45 MPH, that's the highest gust. My structure is rated for 90 mile an hour gusts. It's rated for that with an antenna that is double the size of what I intend to have. So got a tremendous safety in, in that. Plus, whatever they originally designed, it has a safety margin. So as he says, not going to fall over. And that, that's really not your zoning area. You need to decide whether I'm permitted to do this. Building and safety will make sure that it is safe. Property values were mentioned. I provided a uh, page in my information packet, um, which is on page 97 of that packet, talking about the alleged loss of property values. A number of studies have been commissioned to look into the possibility of loss of property values. They have all turned around and said, no, there is no loss. And in fact, one of them said, it doesn't even slow down the rate that a house sells. So the loss of property value, I have evidence indicating it's no, there's no loss. I understand the neighbors have concerns, but they have no evidence, and there is none to be found that I can find. RFI concerns, I've also provided you a table showing that 60, that if I do the worst possible thing, if you're 67 feet away from this, you're still within the margin of safety to, to, given by the government you probably get more exposure from your Wi-Fi. Your Wi-Fi is on 24-7 and then it's close to you. I'm further away. Um, you actually get more exposure from your cell phone, which is a microwave oven that you put against your ear, frankly. Yes. Which people have no, no reluctance to do. You, you can't see it, so you don't realize what right. you're getting. Um, 
I, you know, I, you very astutely noticed that, that I'm not going to paint my tower and antenna red. And that diagram was way out of, out of proportion. I doubt you noticed the green Italian cypress that were in the background. That is my neighbor's tree, a whole series of trees. I've triangulated them at 50 feet or a little bit above. My, I've got a, probably a two foot uh, error possibility. That's 50 feet tall, and Mr. Matsuda is going to be looking down on me, so what he's drawn is, is certainly not, not appropriate. Unfortunately, he apparently sees red. Or let me add one more comment on Mr. Matsuda. Uh, he said that the FCC doesn't require long-range communications under PRB1. That's simply wrong as a matter of law. What PRB1 and the state statutes say is that you've got to reasonably accommodate amateur radio communications in the context of what's being requested. And Mr. Mr. You know, Wegerer has shown the need of long distance communication. So that's what has to be reasonably accommodated. Again, without balancing. Sorry, Warren. Not at all. Also, I uh, might mention on that same topic, Part 97, which is the part of the FCC uh, regulations that deal with amateur radio. One of the stated benefits and intents of amateur radio is international goodwill. I'm going to have a hard time generating goodwill internationally if I can't talk to them. So actually, I think that, that is something that the federal government has an interest in. The last thing that I had just uh, taking note is so we, we heard from someone apparently on Calle Sequoia. Um, I don't know where Calle Sequoia is. It's not any of the three streets that are within the 300 foot radius. So we're apparently hearing from people out of area. My next door neighbor told me that uh, she was talking to somebody who lives at the far end, the opposite end of Calle Yucca, two and a half or three miles away. And she was talking about this terrible structure that is going to be put in. So somebody has apparently gone out and beat the bushes to um, uh, uh, attempt to make their point or, or negate this. So hopefully we're hearing mostly from people that are, are in the area. I don't know, do any of the commissioners have a question? Like I said, I don't want to try to um, address each individual thing, I, I, but I would be happy to but, answer any question that is a concern to you. Let me add one more thing before you do. And I recall reading in the appeal package that uh, I believe Mindy sent to Warren, there were several emails that were only not opposed to the tower, but thought, Warren should be able to fully enjoy his hobby and the like. And I, I don't know what was read and what was not, but I think in the record, um, there are emails that are for it as obviously those are against it. So again, I, I, don't, I don't know the process. That I, don't would, <laughs> I don't get in this too often, but I just wanna make sure we're all, we're all clear Mr. about it. Mr. Robinson, that. those are part of our packet that we okay. read. Thanks. Okay. I'm going to... Uh, Ask staff if they have any. Chair, Chair McPhail? Yes. Uh, I just want to point out that Amber Erdman is raising her hand on Zoom. She already got a chance to voice her opinion. Uh, I'm not sure if we'll give her an opportunity again, but I just wanted to let you know. Uh, Chair, Chair McPhail, Commission. Um, well, once you've heard from the public, unless you have a particular question and the commission needed to reopen the public hearing to ask an additional question of a speaker, you can certainly do that. But typically your protocol is you, you hear once from each of the public speakers. Yeah, that would be my conclusion. So does staff have any uh, closing remarks? I have a, a few remarks, uh, unless Director Ward, okay. Um, just as a final mention here is that obviously we really did want to approve this project when it came to us. Um, and our reasons for denial and our recommendation for denial before you is really based on the CUP findings, not based on uh, any argument about emissions or health risks. And based on the CUP findings, it became apparent that the 65 foot full proposal does not appear to be compatible with this neighborhood. 
And we did make every attempt to work with the applicant on any compromise, anything in terms of stealthing, blending, um, but there, there was no leeway there. And ultimately, uh, the zoning ordinance does say that we, that the applicant has the burden of um, proving to the satisfaction of the decision-making authority that all of the CUP standards can be met. And so that's all I had to say, unless Director Ward had anything to add. I think you've covered it. Uh, thank you. You've heard both staff's analysis and public comment. There, there may be some additional legal points that uh, council would like to share with you before you enter your deliberations. Thank you. Yeah, before we do that, uh, excuse me, uh, Mr. Barnes, I have a quick question of staff. There was a mention that uh, people were saying they weren't noticed. How many notices did you send out and how many, how far away were those notices sent? 300 feet, quarter mile, whatever. The, the notices um, were sent out to 300 feet, um, the hearing notices. Um, and then we also did courtesy emails um, to any individual that was at the previous hearing um, or to any individual that requested to be noticed of the hearing. Um, so the planning division itself mailed postcards to 300 individuals. Um, and I believe it was right around 20 um, uh, email notifications as well on top of that went out. Um, anything beyond that, we, we didn't go beyond the 300 foot radius. Um, it was the 300 feet and then anybody who requested which the 300 feet led us to uh, 34 individuals. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Barnes. Oh, th thank you, Chair McPhail. Um, yeah, I just wanted to kind of circle back to um, and give uh, my opinion on the legal standard. We've, we've heard a lot of legal arguments by the applicant. Um, and, and first I wanted to kind of re reiterate what um, Ms. Fogg said about, you know, we heard uh, one comment, I know there are comments in the record about radio frequency health effects uh, from the proposed project. Just wanted to be crystal clear that federal law does not allow your commission or the county to take such concerns into account in deciding um, this type of application. So, so please, um, please honor that federal law. Um, in terms of uh, yeah, what the legal standard is, in, in, instead of going back and forth, I thought it might be more helpful to cite uh, a, a legal case out of California 2011, and Ms. Smith um, referenced this before. The case is called Zubaru versus City of Palmdale, 2011, and it's 192 Cowlap 4th, 289. And so as Ms. Smith mentioned before, this is a good, um, example case uh, to consider because that in that case the court um, the, the city's decision to deny a property as owner's request to erect a 55 foot um, ham radio antenna uh, and the antenna could be retracted to 21 feet the city denied that request in a um, residential neighborhood and so in um, in upholding so the court upheld that decision as being consistent with with state and federal law um, and so in um, the, the court, and I'll just uh, re read a portion of the opinion, and before I do so, I wanted to um, admit or acknowledge that, that I did misspeak and, and the, the point was well taken. The, the correct standard is, is not a balancing test. It's, um, it, it's a reasonable accommodation. So Mr. Robinson was citing the correct standard there. So I, I apologize for suggesting it's, it's a balancing test. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and read what the, uh, the Palmdale opinion states in terms of the standard, which is correct. Under state and federal law, the city, and so again, that refers to Palmdale, was not required to allow the property owner to erect a tower antenna of any size he wished, regardless of the antenna's compatibility with the surrounding neighborhood. Instead, the applicant uh, was required, I'm sorry, the applicable laws required the city to reasonably accommodate amateur radio communications. 
The city council did make such accommodation when it granted the property owner's appeal, thereby permitting him to maintain his roof mounted antenna, which extends to a height of approximately, approximately 40 feet, and thus to participate in amateur radio communications. And so um, the, the court also detailed the, the reasons why the, the city of Palmdale, the city council denied the request for the 55 foot antenna. Um, and, and in so doing the court validated these reasons. And so the court uh, stated the, the planning commission again of the city and city council found that the installation and operation of the property owner's tower antenna were inconsistent with the purpose intent of the vertical antenna regulations in the city zoning ordinance because the tower antenna was not compatible with the surrounding neighborhood. The tower antenna greatly exceeded the height of all residential buildings and accessory structures in the area and created adverse visual impacts to the neighborhood, especially when the tower antenna was raised to its full height with the horizontal antenna array. Uh, and so that's a direct quotes out of a 2011 California case, which again was based on uh, federal and state law directly on point. Um, so I think that it speaks for itself in terms of the standard. I'd be happy to um, answer any questions. Well, yeah. I, I, I have one, and that Mr. is you Robinson, failed to address the fact that they... You're Mr. Robinson, your yes. time is up, sir. It, it, miss, where Mr. Robinson might be going is that the same decision did find a part of the, the city's ordinance to be to be vague, but that didn't um, undo or, or call into question the city's decision to deny the 55-foot tower. That's, that's not right. It, it's not. Can you cite to a, a part of the, uh, let me know why I'm incorrect on that point. Mr. Robinson, you're muted. Now I'm, now I'm un, uh, unmuted. Right. Let me share a screen. I'm going to share. This one. Oops, did I, did I lose everybody? Or can you see this? Yeah, we can see it. See, it says that's a Zubaru versus city of Palmdale. And, and what, what Zubaru, what that case did is invalidate the very ordinance that you cited. So he didn't have to take his antenna down. So you see what I've got. Zubru considers the city zone, zoning ordinance defectively vague. We agree the sections are impermissibly vague. So regardless of what they did, they threw the statute out. So I don't know how you can possibly say that Zubru supports the proposition. Because the court, the statute the court said it did, and, and uh, neither you nor the applicant has, um, has made an argument that the county's ordinance is, is vague. Well, the point is, okay, wait, 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 wait. That's an argument between you and Mr. Barnes somewhere down the line. Right now, that's not where we're at. Okay. And, and right. And, and so what I would say as a commission's counsel is that, uh, and Mr. Robinson is, of course, free to disagree, that the legal standard that I cited and the considerations that your commission can take into account or as I stated, and I, I stand by that 100%. Okay, uh, Commissioner King had his hand up first and then Commissioner Boyston. Okay, uh, Council Barn, just for clarification, uh, since the, um, the Palmdale's decision, the ordinance was found to be vague and thus, uh, uh, I, don't, I don't think the word thrown out is accurate, but, did that have a bearing on the ability of the applicant to file an appeal of the court ruling or did that become moot because the ordinance was thrown out? Uh, I'm not sure what happened after, you know, I was quoting an appellate court decision. Um, so I'm not sure what happened after, in terms of his, his permit or the tower after that uh, decision came out. Um, so um, I'm not sure that I'm able to, to answer your question. Okay. Well, I mean, that's a problem with case law 
is that it's a it's an evolving thing and it has a tail on it and we could we could take the written opinion of the trial court judge uh and say well we're going to hang our hat on those points because they're right on point however that that may be um we may be hanging our hat on something that's not entirely valid. So uh, and, and this actually, is meant for I, courts to decide, not for the commission. No, yeah, and I would I would respectfully disagree. And actually, I'm I'm looking at the disposition of the opinion, and I'm sorry I didn't do this before. Um, so the 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 opinion the uh, the appellate court um, basically reversed the trial court. Um, the trial court had issued an order um, vacating the, the city's order to, to make the property owner remove the tower. So the, the appellate court basically said, yeah, the tower um, can be ordered removed. And so the, the issue in terms of the, the zoning ordinance was, was separate and apart from that. Um, but, in, but I guess just taking a step back, again, it's... Um, the, I just want to be crystal clear. I, you know, there, there was disagreement apparently about what the legal standard is, and so I was I was quoting portions of the opinion uh, that state what the the legal standard is, the reasonable accommodation, what factors can be taken into account by your commission. I've been hearing a lot how aesthetic concerns and neighborhood compatibility cannot be considered. That's absolutely not true, and so I just want to make that clear to you. Um, and the rest of the commission, um, of course, uh, the the applicant's um, desire for for ham radio uh, needs to be reasonably reasonably accommodated to the extent um, possible. That's also part of the standard. Um, and so, um, anyways, I I'd be happy to answer any other questions. Okay, Commissioner Boyston, do you had a question? Not a question. I'm just waiting for the. Uh public hearing to be over with and we can go on and uh, start uh, talking amongst ourselves. Okay, with that said, I will close the public hearing and does any commissioners have any comments or a motion to make? Wasn't that going to be Commissioner Boydston? <laughs> you want me to go first? I was waiting. I, 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 I assumed that you were going to go first. No, I was just trying to move us along. <laughs> oh, I knew it. Okay. All right, then. Uh, then then King, I'll go. Commissioner King had his hand up first. Okay. Then Commissioner Dukas. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to make a motion because I'm pretty sure where this thing is headed, but I am going to make a couple of comments in deliberation. Uh, the first comment is that... Um, and I didn't count up all of the public speakers and, and mailed in comments from this meeting, but in the original record, there were 22 comments received, 19 of which were opposed to the project. <clears throat> 16 of those cited the view, uh, seven cited the uh, RF emissions, which, uh, Council Barnes advised us again, we cannot consider under federal law. And for me, um, the issue of view is paramount and I'm no clearer now than I was beforehand about the impacts of PRB1 and, uh, and the rulings, particularly because of the um, uh, staff citing the Palmdale case um, so, you know, that's an issue that lawyers and judges can decide. I'm not sure that I'm equipped to do it. Um, however, it's a question mark in my mind. Uh, certainly the issue about the CEQA was settled for me by Mr. Uh, Wegger's comments that cranking up his tower was very noisy. So I think at the very least, uh, a CEQA analysis has to be uh, done, public comments taken, and maybe some um, noise uh, studies done because he's in a whole neighborhood of sensitive receptors. So, you know, 
I think that there's every reason to withdraw the um, the initial belief that this was a categorically exempt from CEQA. Having said all of that, I suspect, and I could be wrong, but I suspect the commission is going to uh, support the many, many neighbors who don't want to look at this thing. Um, I'm not going to be one of them, but that's okay. Okay, Commissioner Dukas. Um, I, uh, th at the very beginning, um, when I asked my first question, it was, what is before us? And I looked at the sketch to understand uh, what we would be deciding on. And that is the 55 foot high um, lattice structure with a, another, a, a, an extension to that of 10 feet of a mast. Beyond that, the, the, the size, the configuration the, of the antenna is not within our purview. So we're just looking at a, a tall structure the thing about this neighborhood is it's, um, the thing that, that uh, is a problem is the topography of this neighborhood and how the neighborhood was developed. It is a very large hillside and there are homes that um, were constructed to have unimpeded views of the Santa Monica Mountains and the sunset and uh, the, the Barranca or whatever the, the little uh, natural area is that's left there that's not developed. Additionally, there is a very large park called Wildwood Regional Park that is a draw from, from you know, to people from Los Angeles come to, to Thousand Oaks Wildwood Park. And um, Mr. Wagerer's um, property is, is four houses down from that. And um, I understand uh, people in the neighborhood utilize the trail. We have um, testimony saying that people from the neighborhood uh, utilize that trail, but um, uh, people from outside of the neighborhood utilize that trail as well as they're exploring the extensive trail system. So it's, it's not just, um, you know, the view from one person's window or one person's patio, there is um, a, a lot to um, think about when you think about something that is um, as visually um, prominent as um, this particular application would be. For example, it's likelihood of um, silhouetting against a ridge line that is to the north of uh, north of uh, of the subject property. So um, I think that um, a lot of the points that were raised here are very interesting, um, and um, and I just want to make sure that we stay in our lane. So um, I do believe that the the uh, project would be inconsistent and incompatible with the neighborhood. The height is completely out of character. And um, just because of, of where the subject property uh, lies, it would, um, it would stick out. It'd be different if it were flat, but um, because people look up and people look down, it is, it's visual prominence is, is greater than it would be if, if we were talking about some, you know, other lot. That's just, that's just where it is. Um, I do think it would cause adverse impacts and impair utility. So um, I support staff's recommendations and um, so move. Is there a second? I'll second. Seconded by Mr. Boyston. Any other comments? I have a couple. Number one, I think I've made it clear on the time that I've been on this commission that I have a trouble with NIMBYism. And to me, that's what this whole thing is all about, is NIMBYism. 
I, I, I cannot believe that a ham radio tower will impact anybody's home value in Ventura County. That's just not going to happen. We don't have an inventory. If we had large inventories, maybe so, but not now, no. And probably not anywhere near the near future either. Uh, I, I find it difficult that uh, a lot of the arguments brought up were the same arguments when it comes to cell towers and the same arguments that we have with anything that has to do with cell towers and that sort of thing. And we're not talking about a cell tower here. So uh, I, I'm not gonna be able to support the motion. Just Commissioner Boyston. I guess the, the real question to me, you know, in this, in this uh, hearing today is, you know, what is reasonable? Um, what, is re what is a reasonable height to allow a person uh, to have his, his or her desired communication? And I think when you get there, you know, as, as it was stated, if, if a person comes and says, well, I want to communicate with Europe, I need, and I bought this lot and I need a 90 foot tower. We could be making the same kind, we could be hearing the same kind of arguments uh, over and over again. So it's about reasonable, what is reasonable. And the county um, has stated that they feel that the 40, doing what they're doing, ministerially giving 40 feet, and then a CUP, which analyzes specific context, um, that by having that process, uh, that is re reasonable. It, it gives it gives a reasonable outcome for someone desiring to communicate through uh, a, a ham radio, which requires a tower. So um, I think you're going down a, a rabbit hole and creating precedents if you um, if you don't uh, uphold the appeal, or if you um, uphold the appeal um, and allow this tower to be built because the next person down the block is going to say, I want to, I want to communicate with Asia. And it it, it takes, you know, 80 feet. And we'll hear the same argument over and over again. Um, it'll keep going higher. I, I agree with that somewhat, but with that argument, we wouldn't have a cell tower in this county. Yeah. Uh, just a second, Mr. Uh, Commissioner. King. Uh, the one thing I forgot to bring up is huh, it just left. Commissioner King, go ahead. Okay. Well, I mean, I don't know if this is even worth adding, and I'd like to move this along too. It's dragged out all morning and into the afternoon, but um, just a couple of personal uh, anecdotes to kind of tell you where I'm coming from here. Um, when I put my 50-foot tower and 26-foot uh, boom, six-element Yagi and rotor up in my yard attached to my house. A number of my neighbors, and I get along pretty well with my neighbors, weren't real happy about it, and they came and talked to me about it. Um, but, you know, our city let us do it, let me do it, and I did it. And uh, it dramatically improved my ability to communicate literally around the world, including to India on one watt of power. So think about that for a minute, Mr. Wegger. Um, nevertheless, over time, you know, initially a couple of neighbors knocked on my door and said, you're interfering with my TV. Well, I was pretty sure I had a clean station. Uh, so I'd pull out my log and say, well, when did this happen? They said, just now. I said, well, I haven't had the radio on in three days and show them my logbook. So that kind of went away after a while. And then nobody seemed to notice it anymore after a while until the Northridge earthquake. And folks, right after the Northridge earthquake, 
I was getting folks coming to my door asking if I could communicate because the power was off, because uh, the phones were down. There were all kinds of issues, and I was happy to accommodate them. That same time, I took a day and worked in the city's emergency operations center as a ham radio operator, coordinating communication, including uh, coordinating getting diesel fuel to Simi Hospital because their fuel for their generator was running out. And it was because of ham radio operators in the uh, RACI system in Ventura County that we were able to solve that problem. So when folks say, well, you know, ham radio operators really don't, they're not necessary. We got cell phones, we got this, we got that. I know from personal experience that um, it is important and they do a valuable service. And sometimes long range communication is of some value. And that's kind of what informs uh, where I come from on this. But having said that, I recognize that uh, amateur radio is a privilege granted by the FCC and there ought to be reasonable accommodations. And if I were making a motion, which I'm not, I would have remanded this back to staff, asking that a, a, a new CEQA determination be made. And they work with the applicant because there are ways to deal with raising and lowering that tower that probably aren't as noisy as uh, uh, lawyer Robinson said. And there are probably ways to deal with the dipole antenna so it doesn't hang in the yard. There are a lot of things that can be done to make this case better. Uh, assuming that somewhere along the line we figure out that we haven't really made as reasonable accommodation as we think we have. Nevertheless, I just wanted to share that personal story to say there's more to this. This is not nearly as simple as you might think it is. Thank you, Commissioner King, because that's what I was going to bring up, the Northridge earthquake and how invaluable the ham operators were when the county had no communications, basically otherwise. And uh, I was still the Ag Commissioner then, and uh, their service was invaluable. And if I remember correctly, which I probably don't, I would think if I remember correctly, the Board of Supervisors gave the Ham Radio Association accommodation for their help during the, earth, the Northridge earthquake. They did. Uh, I think that was very appropriate, but we have a motion in front of us. Oh, excuse me, excuse me, Commissioner Boyston. Yeah, I, I just want to make it clear. I'm not in opposition to ham radios or 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 uh, degrading their value in the community. To me, this is really about context, and it, it's even amplified context with the uh, with the hill terrain, and also, but the fact that they've underground everything up there. Um, so it's really about context to me, not, not about denying the use. Chair, Chair McVeigh, um, one comment from staff, just in listening to your deliberations and the uh, motion put forward by Commissioner Padukas, some of the comment was focused on the regional visual impact to the public park, the Wildwood Park, and I don't know if that is a basis for part of your decision making. The finding number five doesn't capture that component. It does talk about compatibility and with the neighborhood, but I just wanted to bring that forward if that was part of what you wanted to encapsulate in your motion. Uh, we could take that direction and add that to finding five, uh, or you can just go with what you have. So thank you. Um, and, and, uh, I didn't include it because it seemed like I was the only person who knew that. Um, uh, there was there was um, a a person who mentioned uh, the the trail use. Um, um, could could I ask um, legal counsel if it's appropriate to introduce uh, uh, my pictures now? Or if if it's necessary, um, I I uh, I don't know if Mr. Wager is going to pursue this in front of the board of supervisors, or whether he's going to come back with something, you know, reapply or something. But um, I don't even know if he would dispute that that uh, the the antenna 
would um, would be visible from uh, Wildwood Park, the Linmuir Linmuir Trail. Yeah, no, th yeah. Thanks, for, thanks for asking. If you introduce the pictures, um, I would advise to open up the public hearing and let the, um, the applicant address the pictures themselves, not to relitigate the case. Um, but he should be a, a afforded a comment. Um, uh, otherwise, the the pictures could be submitted if it's appealed uh, uh, to the board um, and, and gotten in the record um, there. But it's. I, the best practice is after you close a public hearing not to submit any other evidence. Um, um, I and and as far as my um, my firsthand observation is that is that if I'm the only person that made that observation, is it is it appropriate for the for the whole commission to then sign off on it just on my say so? I. Um, I mean, assuredly, you can see it from the Linmuir Trail portion of Wildwood Park. Um, yes, yeah, that's that's evidence. Um, uh, commissioners are not. Um, they, it, it's it's allowable for commissioners to introduce evidence. You disclose it up front. Um, the applicant was able to address it um, because uh, you you introduced it before he you know was done with his presentation and rebuttal. And so the commission can base its decision on any evidence, including the, your, your observations about the trail and visibility from the trail. I don't know what to do. <laughs> do I, do I send, uh, do I send you these, uh, do I send the, do we reopen the public hearing and I send these pictures and everybody looks at these, at these pictures? I can do that right now. I'm I'm not inclined to reopen the public hearing, Commissioner. Yeah. You yeah. Can, um, can um um Director Ward with with all due respect, can we just have the um the uh motion stand the way it is to move staff's recommendations? Certainly. Yes, you can. And and if it goes forward, then I'm sure someone who is listening will go and and um you know and it can be handled then. I mean, I, I just want to I want to be fair. Well, you can also send the pictures to your supervisor if it's appealed to this board. Yeah, yeah. So with that said, Secretary Rodusco, if there are any other comments or questions, would you please call the roll? Okay, uh, before I call roll, I just want to clarify if the motion is to approve staff recommendations or to... Um... That's correct. Okay, sounds good. Okay, uh, Chair McPhail? No. Vice Chair Boydston? Yes. Commissioner Dukas? Yes. Commissioner King? No. Commissioner Garcia? Yes. Okay, motion carries three to two. Thank you, Mr. Wagerer. Thank you, Mr. Robinson. Very interesting points you raised and there's a lot to learn about this. Thank you for everybody who was on Zoom and make comments and who submitted emails. Thank you very much. Now, the next big question, do we wanna take a lunch break or do we wanna keep going? Commissioner Boyston. I have a hard stop at 145 that I have to, to uh, leave the meeting and uh, attend another. Then let's, if it's all right with the rest of the commission, we will continue on. I hear, okay. Next item on the agenda is item number eight, okay. number PL21-0002, applicant Rancho La Vista, LLC, project description a request for conditional use permit to operate a proposed bed and breakfast in project within two existing dwellings, the initial CUP term would be for 10 years, project location 334 and 35 
zero East Villanova Road near Ojai. Environmental document categorically exempt, section 15301. Case planner, Charles Anthony. Is Charles Anthony with us? Yes, I am. Well, there you are. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, uh, Chair, do I, uh, Chair McPhail, do I have permission to share my screen? Just a second. At this time, I would like to ask each planning commissioner to state on the record whether or not he or she has received any oral or written ex parte communication regarding this agenda item that is not already contained in the record before us on this matter. Please disclose the substance of that information only if that information is not contained in the record before us on this matter. Secretary Reduso, would you pull the commission, please? Chair McPhail? No disclosures. Vice Chair Boydston? No disclosures. Commissioner Garcia? No disclosures. Commissioner King? No disclosures. Commissioner Idukas? I have no disclosures. Okay. Uh, where'd you go? Well, there you are. Uh, Mr. Oh, Mr. Anthony? The yes. Floor is yours. Okay. okay, good afternoon, Chair McPhail and members of the commission. My name is Charles Anthony and I'm the case planner for the proposed bed and breakfast in project case number PL21-0002. Before beginning, just want to alert the public that they, of course, can email any of their comments of 250 words or less to planning.pccomments.ventura.org. Please indicate in the subject line, agenda item 7B. Staff will read your comments to the planning commission. <clears throat> so the presentation overview will include a project locate, show the project location, show the project description and the setting. Staff will discuss consistency and analysis and findings. And then finally, we'll recommend we'll, our actions to the decision makers, to you all about our recommendations. The proposed project would be located on two large parcels, 92 acres and 98 acres near the city of Ojai adjacent to Villanova Road, south and east of Highway 33. As you can see in the slide, the proposed CUP boundary would be located across a small portion of the two parcels. The size is approximate of the CUP boundary would be approximately three acres. The owner of the of the and the applicant of the CUP and of, and of the parcels is located and lives on the property here in the area that I'm circling with my cursor, which is uh, the main dwelling of the property. Both parcels are designated agricultural exclusive or AE zone. And the next slide is a zoom in area showing the dwellings, the proposed dwellings, or the, rather the existing dwellings that would be used for the proposed B&B. &B. And again, they are located within the AE zone. Across the street is the, across the Villanova Road are some existing dwellings and they're in the rural exclusive zone. The site of the existing parcels are mostly, are currently being uh, farmed with citrus and avocado. Agricultural ranch staff currently live and work on the, on the parcels. Within two existing dwellings within the proposed CUP boundary uh, are three bedrooms and that would be available for 10 guests per dwelling maximum of 10, 
no more, no more than six of those would be permitted to be adults. Guests served would be by two existing employees, so no new employees would be needed to be added for the proposed project. A ranch manager would be available 24 seven to answer any uh, questions, receive any complaints or concerns from neighbors, and no offsite parking would be permitted. This photo shows one of the, one of the existing dwellings in which the proposed BNB would be located. So three new parking spaces would be required at each dwelling. Minor grading uh, for one of the dwellings would be required for three of the parking spaces at this particular site. This is the 350 Villanova Road dwelling. No vegetation removal would be required. No trees would need to be required and no changes to the existing structures. So no type of additions, no types of alterations would be required or proposed for the proposed b, &B. This is one of the site plans. And in my cursor, I'm uh, circling over the proposed, or actually it's the existing dwelling in which one of the proposed uh, b and would be located. And this is at 334 Villanova Road. And then adjacent to it is a detached garage, which would be available for parking. And then here are three proposed par parking spaces. These parking spaces at this location would not require any grading decomposed granite would be laid on the ground directly. And then across the way is the 350 East Villanova Road dwelling. That garage is attached. And this is the site where three of the uh, parking spaces would require the minor grading. This is a view from Villanova Road, the public view of 334 Villanova. And as you can see, the existing vegetation and trees screen at the the dwelling from the public view. So the public would not be from the view, from the rather from the public street, would not be able to see the dwelling. This is coming in through the gates. This is still at 334 Villanova. This is coming in through the gates and through the vegetation. And this is what the guests would be able to, uh, <clears throat> to occupy, excuse me. As I said, no uh, alterations, no additions would be added to the structure or to, or to either structure and this structure included. This is a street view of the second dwelling. This is at 350 East Villanova. And this of course is uh, viewable from Villanova Road. So this is existing. This is one of the, this is considered a ranch style existing dwelling. Over here where I'm circling with my cursor is the location of the proposed uh, three parking spaces that would require the minor grading. As you can see, there's no vegetation currently at the site. Planning staff determined that the project would be categorically exempt uh, because of existing facilities exemption um, in CEQA. Planning staff reviewed the general plan policies, the Ojai Valley area plan policies and the zoning ordinance to determine consistency and compliance for the project. Planning staff found that the project would be consistent with all policies and also would comply and conform with the zoning standard zoning ordinance standards and sections. And this is sort of a rundown of some of the key issue areas and standards and identifying the no farmland would be removed from the project. As I mentioned, no vegetation, so no significant adverse impacts to bi biological resources. <clears throat> Air emissions are less than significant. Fire protection was reviewed by fire department and considered adequate water resource, uh, water access and response time. Water supply, there's no net increase in the existing water use above what's existing in the, in the dwellings currently. And I already mentioned the parking spaces. As I mentioned, staff found that the project would be consistent. With regard to the zoning ordinance section 8107-40 limiting B and Bs to cultural heritage sites in the AE zone, this was adopted in the year 2000. In 2005, ordinance five, th rather 4317 was adopted allowing B&Bs in the AE zone without this limitation. The purpose of ordinance 4317 was to expand rural tourism in the agricultural and open space zones. 
but Section 8107.40 limiting B&Bs to cultural heritage sites was not removed when Ordinance 4317 was adopted. This internal conflict within the zoning ordinance will be resolved in 2022 when planning staff removes this limiting section from the zoning ordinance. And if the commissioners are interested in more details, of course, they can be found in exhibits six and seven. As far as neighborhood compatibility, uh, the project is, as mentioned, not adjacent to offsite properties to the west, south, or east, only across the street to the north of across the street from Villanova Road would any of offsite residents be adjacent to the project. Mentioned no vegetation would be removed, no change to no significant change to visual character, no new lighting or signage is proposed. There would be no increase in AM or PM peak hour traffic trips. There's no adverse impact to, low, to the level of service to area roads. All parking would be accommodated on site and quiet hours would be required between the hours of 10 p.m. and 7 a.m. Staff, planning staff recommends to your commission that you grant CUP case number PL21-0002 subject to the conditions of approval. Once again, to remind the public who are, who are listening in that they may email their comments 250 words or less to planning.pccomments at ventura.org. Please indicate in the subject line, agenda item 7B. Planning staff will read your comment to the Planning Commission. Members of the public who wish to speak, please press the raise hand button on Zoom now, or if participating by telephone, please press star and then nine to be queued. This is for agenda item 7B. Planning staff will be available now for to answer any questions and then following questions and answers, the project agent, Mr. Mark Lloyd, will be making a presentation through Zoom himself. Thank you very much. Is there any questions to staff from the commission? Commissioner Boyston? I just wondered uh, who lives in these houses now? So um, Mark may be able to tell you currently, but the last I, when we did a site visit was in 334 Villanova Road, that pro particular project our dwelling rather was used for storage. And the 350 uh, dwelling, Villanova dwelling, that one is currently uh, sometimes occupied by the residents who live on, or rather the owners, who all also occupy that master principal dwelling on the, the first lot. And so, but they sometimes also will occupy this three, the 350 uh, dwelling. But they're not occupied by, uh agricultural workers? Uh, to my, unless much changed, Mark, uh, no, they are not. Thank you. Okay, any other questions from the commission? Hearing none, I'll open oh. up public hearing. Well, and wait a second, Commissioner Hearing Dukas. Where is, I can't see her. I don't have her on my screen, so I well, can't see her. Well, she's waving at you. Well, okay. So, so uh, may I ask a question? Certainly. Okay, so we um, we got some uh, emails, I think, um, late emails on uh, questions about traffic and speed and advisability of stop signs. And I was wondering if um, I read them last night and I was wondering if stat staff had a response to those issues raised in those emails. Mindy can, can follow up with me if she has anything further, but I spoke with, uh, actually spoke with that commenter and his concern was that he has no concern with the project whatsoever. He just wanted to see if this was an opportunity that uh, a, at uh, the intersection, I think it was at uh, Loma, Loma and also Villanova Road, if a stop sign could be added at that site, um, at that particular section. And I told him that this, uh, as far as I know, the scope of the project would not allow that type of additional requirement. Um, however, I encouraged him very much, uh, his first name was Dan, is Dan. And I encouraged Dan to please make his comments and if the commissioners had any thoughts or any uh, recommendations uh, themselves that they could address him. Yeah, I couldn't, uh, 
I couldn't see the connection between um, this this use and that and imposing something like that. I was just wondering um, if you had a chance to see it too. I did. Thank you. And he is he is uh, queued up to speak today too. Okay. Uh, can you unshare your screen? So. Oh yes. My apologies. Mm -hmm. Here we go. Okay, we have. Uh, with that, I'll open the public hearing. Does the applicant have a presentation? Yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is Mark Lloyd of LMP Consultants representing the applicant. Um, I do have a PowerPoint presentation. Um, didn't get to see um, Charles's uh, presentation, so mine might be a little repetitive, but I will go through it very quickly. And I have provided that to Charles to put up for you. Um, Mr. Lloyd, can you see the screen? I can, thank you. Great. Yeah, so um, this first slide here is of the entire uh, Rancho La Vista property. It's made up of four parcels. It's about uh, 370 acres. And I just wanted to give you a broader perspective than just the two parcels which the uh, CUP application covers. Um, you can see noted the 350 and uh, 334 address at the very northerly line of the property along the Villanova Road frontage. Um, there is the ranch manager's house noted there on the left hand side in the yellow. And then uh, at the lower um, to the lower right of that is the main house residence. Um, as you can see, the uh, the property has uh, significant av agricultural production in both avocados and citrus and some dry, dry farming um, going on on the property. And then that uh, on the far right, that white water tank is the, uh, the uh, water district's water storage area or tank for the area. And they have a donut hole parcel there. Um, next slide, Charles, please. Um, this is a Zoom in on the uh, on the CUP area itself. As Charles noted, it's about three acres. Um, you can see the 350 Villanova House and the 334 Villanova House. Um, the additional parking spaces for 334 are noted there, and then the three new parking spaces for 350 Villanova and their location. As Charles pointed out, that is uh, an area that's basically a, a dirt area next to a, the concrete driveway. And we'll put down some DG for the parking area there. Uh, there's an orchard between the, uh, the, the two house sites. And then the driveway designation is the entry drive to the main ranch that this um, 334 unit is off of. You can also note the houses across the street. Um, there's about eight or 10 neighbors there. Um, I reached out to all of them by both um, attempting to call them. And I sent a letter to each of them with a brief description of the project and then with my contact information and an offer to contact me with any concerns or questions or clarifications they may have or want. Um, I ended up speaking to um, three of the neighbors and had good conversations with them. Um, they were in support of the project is what I would ascertain. Um, they did have some concerns and those generally dealt with um, traffic and privacy issues. Um, and I, as I go through this presentation, I'll, I'll get into those responses. Um, in answer to Commissioner Boydston's um, question about who resides in the properties or in the units, um, there is no farm worker um, residence in these units, nor have there been in the past. We have a farm manager who lives up as in that uh, cottage that was up on the upper part of the property shown in the previous photo. Um, the owners had rented these units out as Airbnbs. And as I'm sure you're well aware, in 2018, the county had a prohibition for that in this area, the Ojai Valley area. So uh, my client ceased that operation. And um, there has been some family occupation of the units from time to time, as Charles noted, there's some storage in it. 
And, uh, you know, we've been pursuing this uh, first B&B permit in this area uh, for over a year now and uh, have not had these occupied um, except for family occupation from time to time. Um, next slide, please, Charles. Uh, again, here's a view of the house, um, which is a view that Charles had showed you. Um, this house is, uh, is more exposed to the uh, frontage road, uh, but it's still um, some 200 feet from residences across the street to the closest residence. Next slide, please. And this is a shot of the, the garage area, parking area and uh, entry. Next slide. Um, both these properties have ample backyards to them that are um, landscaped very nicely and have facilities for them so that uh, we believe that tenants will be migrating to the backyards when they're outside, which again is on the opposite side of the neighbors across the street, and therefore will afford them uh, not only the privacy, but a buffer, a visual buffer for um, seeing or observing guests, and I think will also act to attenuate noise to a certain effect. Next slide, please. Um, this is a picture of the backyard patio trellis. There's a great uh, arbor across it. And again, this is behind the building. And I point out to you that, um, you know, there's, there's, there's a quality rental here of which people can enjoy and have areas to congregate and uh, have meals and meet and talk. And, and they're behind the buildings uh, and on the opposite side from our neighbors. Next slide, please. And again, another um, seating area in the back of the 350 house. Next slide, please. So this is a view across the street. Um, this is a street view from Google Street um, View program. And uh, this is 487 East Villanova. It's directly across the street um, from the 350 site. And um, I have spoken to the owners here. Um, they have some concerns about privacy and um, you know, I talked about the operations, which I'll get into a little bit more detail. And again, after discussions with them, um, I think they were um, they were comfortable uh, with the privacy factors. And uh, street parking was also an issue with them. Next slide, please. And this is the property to the left, 451 Villanova, and also spoke to this owner, and um, she actually supports the project. Um, she said she was going to send a letter in. I don't know if that happened or not. Next slide, please. This is the street view of 334. It's not much different than Charles's view, except it's not at the entry. Um, the, uh, the dwelling unit is back in those um, bushes and trees, um, just about centered on this photograph. But obviously, I'm trying to demonstrate to you that there's quite a bit of visual um, screening um, to this residence particularly. Next slide, please. And this is the entry and you go in here and then go to the right and the residence is about 150 feet to the right of this driveway entry. Next slide, please. Again, a view of the house that Charles showed you. Next slide, please. The garage parking. Uh, and then the three additional parking spaces is just to the left of this. And uh, it's an existing improved parking area and we're just gonna add additional uh, decomposed granite to it. Next slide, please. This is the backyard view of the 334 Villanova property. It's pretty well wooded and landscaped. Next slide, please. These are views across the street to 391 Villanova. Um, as you can see, um, that property is also very um, screen from the view. So I think uh, privacy issues here are, um, are superior. Next slide, please, Charles. And this is the next adjacent property opposite the entry drive. You can see the house far back there. And again, um, some pretty uh, significant screening and uh, privacy between, um, between the properties. Next slide, please. So um, findings for the CUP approval, um, you know, one of the issues here that's important to us is the compatibility with the surrounding neighborhood. In fact, I think this is sort of the, the paramount finding. And per the bullet points I've listed here, the B&B dwellings are the same ranch style as the surrounding single family dwellings. So there's no change in the rural low density neighborhood character here. Uh, we believe that the structures are, rem are replicable of the um, 
the structures that are around the area and we have no proposed changes to them other than the DG paving for the three additional parking spaces. And we believe that the B&B &B uses are of a character that fits in with the rural low density neighborhood character. One of the things we've done as a voluntary um, condition of approval in our project description was to have entire dwelling rentals. So that causes the B&Bs to operate as a pseudo single family use. Um, we are not engaging and we have by our voluntary condition prohibited the rental of single rooms and therefore having, let's just say up to, to uh, three different rental parties that are not associated with each other renting the house. We believe this adds to the sort of family style and ambiance of the B&B &B, and again is conducive and fits with the rural low density neighborhood character. Um, three, privacy. The B&B &B uses, as I stated, 200 feet or more from the neighboring dwellings with ample and inviting um, yard sizes and use areas in the backyards. Uh, parking, uh, all five parking spaces on site, no street parking. Again, this um, um, this addresses um, some of the neighbor concerns that I heard. Um, traffic, um, one of the things before starting this, this project with full knowledge of the um, general plan provisions that deal with Highway 33 traffic and increase in peak hour morning and noon trips as being a significant uh, hurdle and threshold. Um, first thing I did was had a traffic study done um, for this use for the properties. And our traffic study shows that in fact, the traffic generated for this B&B use is actually a lower generation than the single family traffic that would result from single um, family use of the houses. Um, as far as noise goes, and of course, this is a, a, a great concern, I think, to both us and to neighbors. Um, we don't want noise disturbances happening. We have restrictions on noise generation. There are restrictions through the conditions of approval on any events uh, associated with the um, the B and B use and a restriction in the occupancy. So we think that this is addressing the issues as to noise, and as important, if not more important, again, is just the location and the um, character and design, the existing design of the B and Bs and their distance from the neighbors, the screening for the neighbors, where we think people will congregate in the B and B use and how that is more conducive um, to there being um, no noise that would be amplified and, and adversely affect the neighbors. Um, and then oversight, we have 24-7, uh, 365 manager presence on the property to regulate the tenants and respond to any neighbor concerns and complaints. Another um, condition um, that we've offered up for the project is that uh, we will supply all of our surrounding neighbors with contact information, both email and telephone for our ranch manager. And so that if uh, any tenant problems would arise, there's immediate contact uh, with the manager and immediate action to be taken to um, deal with whatever concerns or questions that a neighbor may have. Um, next screen, please, Charles. And then uh, I think another important finding area, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not uh, looking at necessarily the balance of, of the findings, but, uh, or, or competition with the findings, but the agricultural um, compatibility issues in general uh, plan and zoning uh, compliance and consistency issues are important. And uh, Charles, Charles related this also, the B and B use will not displace for reduce or adversely affect agricultural resources or the viability of uh, existing agricultural operations. Uh, the applicants have a robust and um, agricultural operation that they are proud of and want to sustain. And uh, they, um, we believe that this B&B &B use will have no adverse effect on that. Um, the location of the B&B &B use is separated from and will not conflict with the existing agricultural operations and uh, will not reduce prime farmland or prime soils resources. Um, the B&B &B revenue stream will help sustain and preserve agricultural lands for general plan policy goal AG1. Um, I think this is a very important um, um, finding um, that is able to be made here. I think that um, 
We all realize that agriculture um, is challenged as far as being a viable economic operation all over um, all over California, but particularly in the coastal counties. Um, as you know, our land values are quite high and there is constant pressure to subdivide, densify, and you all are dealing with legislation coming down from the state, whether it's ADUs or SB9 or 10, that is taking regulation away from you. So I think it's imperative that we get alternative revenue streams going for agricultural lands that help sustain and preserve these large agricultural blocks that we have in our community. Uh, these are anchors for the for our health and our environment, our wildlife, and, and I believe this B&B &B approval is a great model for us to go forward um, with complementing agriculture. Um, project lighting is consistent with dark skies overlay zone, a very important thing to us too. Uh, the B&B &B is consistent with the intent of the zoning ordinance and the B&B &B use has been reviewed by and approval recommended by both the Ag Commissioner and the Ojai Valley Municipal Advisory Council. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to blow through this very quickly because I'd like um, to respect uh, Commissioner Boydston's timeframes. And lastly, I would just encourage you to um, adopt the findings and the recommendations of staff and, rec and approve the CUP use. Thank you for your time. And I'm here to answer any questions that you may have. Mr. Chair, thank you. You're, you're welcome. Thank you. Any questions from commissioners? Uh, okay, now, okay, I've got all of you back on my screen. Okay, uh, do we have any presentation from the general public? I did receive one. Um... There's also one speaker. He's raising his hand. Okay, so I believe the speakers go first. Uh, Dan Parzial. Hello. Um, yeah, so thanks so much for, for allowing me to speak. Uh, as was mentioned by Charles Anthony, I'm not opposed to the bed and breakfast on its face. Uh, that being said, I do think there are some huge concerns related to traffic, and I want to offer what I believe is a simple solution uh, to some of the concerns that I have and that have been echoed by a number of the neighbors. Uh, my family and I live at 229 East Villanova Road. We've spoken with neighbors about the pace and volume of traffic on Villanova combined with a very dangerous intersection at Loma in Villanova. It's common practice for people to use East Villanova Road to avoid three stoplights on their way into or out of Ojai. The three lights people avoid by cutting through on Villanova are at the intersection of Highway 33 and the west end of Villanova Road, uh, at the intersection of Highway 33 and Baldwin, and at the intersection of Highway 33 and Loma. Uh, by turning onto Villanova, one can avoid all these intersections and without any stop signs on Villanova itself, cars often go as fast as they can to beat the stoplights and the traffic. I hope that I'm not giving uh, any new information to people who are on the Zoom and not aware of this stoplight avoiding maneuver. Uh, there are a few extenuating circumstances that make this more dangerous. Uh, with Villanova High School, I'm the oldest of five kids, grew up here in Ohio. All four of my siblings went to Villanova High School. So I was uh, dropping siblings off there all the time. And uh, you know, it just causes more traffic uh, on the road. Uh, obviously, I think with the you know, the 400 plus acre Rancho La Vista property on the south side of Villanova, the subject property. There's a large number of wildlife that was mentioned. Uh, we've seen deer, mountain lions. We had a bear on our property this year. Cars going to quickly strike large animals all the time on, on Villanova. And when going south on Loma Drive uh, towards Villanova, if it's possible, I can do a quick screen share and show you this intersection. Uh, it's really, really dangerous. Um, it's impossible to see oncoming traffic that's traveling west on Villanova Road due to a sharp curve that hides cars just before the intersection. Traffic that often travels much faster than the posted steep speed limit is incredibly dangerous, and I've witnessed several accidents at that intersection just the three years we've lived here. 
Neighbors have reported several deaths due to collisions at this intersection, which makes sense. You're hit on the driver's side, T-boned by cars traveling west. Um, it's incredibly dangerous. Uh, I disagree with the comment that this is not related to the bed and breakfast as any increased traffic uh, due to the bed and breakfast will only make this worse, especially given that those using the B&B will not likely be familiar with the dangerous intersection. I've personally never seen a car enter or exit the two residences in question. And given that I would assume we all know who owns this property, I would be hard pressed to believe that the owner utilizes either of these existing dwellings for the residents. Therefore, the BNB will certainly increase traffic and is directly related to the concerns that I'm presenting. Um, I personally ask anyone visiting our home not to use Loma to access Villanova because of the danger posed there. Stop signs would eliminate this risk. If you have the opportunity to experience this thrilling endeavor on your own, I highly recommend passing on the chance and taking the extra time to drive to either end of Villanova Road to avoid the dangerous turn. People living on Villanova and adjacent lanes walk on Villanova to get to the bike path along the 33. There is no sidewalk, very little shoulder uh, on Villanova, so the pace and volume of the traffic makes it very dangerous to walk or ride your bike on Villanova to get to the bike path. From personal experience, walking my four and six-year-old daughters, there have been a number of close calls by cars going incredibly fast around the turns approaching Loma Drive. Uh, there are a few simple things that can be done to improve the situation and make the road safer for everyone, including the people who will be using the proposed B&B. Stop signs put in on Villanova at the intersection of Loma and Villanova uh, would stop cars traveling both east and west on Villanova. This would make the intersection much safer for people turning on to Loma. I'm sorry, from Loma on to Villanova. And it would slow down traffic on Villanova overall. It may also reduce the number of cars that just use Villanova to avoid the stoplights on the 33. To support the efficacy of those stop signs, more visible speed limit signs and signs warning about the upcoming newly installed, hopefully, stop signs would be really helpful. Uh, widening the shoulder on Villanova where possible and maintaining it more regularly would be helpful. Um, just some simple things that I think from living here, uh, growing up in Ojai, coming back a few years ago, um, this has been a well-known problem for forever. Uh, it's an incredibly dangerous road and it feels like a very simple solution. Um, if I were opening a B&B on this road, uh, I would want my tenants uh, to be safe. And I think that this would help. I have no idea if this is the appropriate forum to even be bringing this up, which is why I had the conversation uh, with folks yesterday, trying to determine whether it was worth kind of jumping back and forth on this for the entire day to, to make this comment. But hopefully this uh, can start a conversation. Um, I appreciate you giving me the time to speak. Thanks so much. Thank you. Any questions of Mr. Purcell? None. Thank you very much. Uh, Secretary Dusko, you had one email? Uh, so it was actually from our speaker, so uh, we won't read it. Uh, it. It came in from Dan. Okay. Uh, any closing comments by staff? Hearing none. Yeah, I think, oh, Chair, uh, Chair McVale, just on the comments that we just heard about, uh, we will still engage with my associate director with the Public Works, Roads and Transportation Division. You know, when we do hear comments, we want to be able to share, even if this project under its review uh, is not triggering a necessary circulation improvement, it is still helpful to share feedback that we hear in our public hearing. So I do intend to follow up with the Public Works Agency and with Dan, uh, Mr. Purzell, to let him know that we communicated because maybe there are a couple items that could be addressed and making sure that the Public Works Division is aware of some of the concerns in this area of OI. Thank yeah. you. I think several of us were gonna bring that up that perhaps a conversation with Public Works would be appropriate. Any other questions of staff? Hearing none, I will close the public hearing and any comments or motion? Uh, Chair McPhail, I just, had a comment before we go into deliberations. I just wanted to disclose that 
I received an email from the public speaker during our hearing, but I did not read it. So I don't know what the contents were, but he did just address the full commission. So I just wanted to mention that. Commissioner Boyston first and then Commissioner King. Well, I'd, I'd just like to uh, make a motion to approve uh, with staff recommendations. And uh, just to add something um, that on the 350 property where uh, the house is closer to the road and they're putting in parking, I'd like to see some landscape screen between that park, new parking and the actual um, Villanova Road. Commissioner King. I'll go ahead and second that motion. Commissioner Idukas. Um, I, I saw uh, Mr. Lloyd nodding, but um, maybe um, Director Ward could answer um, Mr. Boydston or Commissioner Boydston's suggestion that we um, condition that um, new parking area to be screened with landscaping as as planning finds appropriate and agreeable to the applicant. Yes, uh, if, if Mr. Lloyd on behalf of his clients indicating they're supportive of making that change, that would find its way into condition number one, the product description to make that modification. Yes, Mr. Chair, I think that's an excellent condition and suggestion and we wholeheartedly embrace it. Thank you. Okay, any other comments from commission members? With that, Secretary Vadusco, will you call the roll please? Chair McPhail? Aye. Vice Chair Boydston? Aye. Commissioner Idukas? Aye. Commissioner King? Aye. Commissioner Garcia? Aye. Okay, motion carries. Okay. Uh, Chairman, I, I really need to exit here, so I apologize for that. No problem. We'll see you next time. Okay, take care. Okay, uh, item number eight, discussion by planning director. Thank you, Chair McPhail, commissioners. I'll be brief, you've had a very long day. Uh, the uh, no reportable items from the Board of Supervisors. They did meet last week in session and they'll meet again next week, um, but there weren't any things uh, related to RMA planning division to report out. As I described at our last meeting, the upcoming planning commission hearings, uh, we do have items for both February 10th and February 17th. The February 10th one, as I mentioned last time, involves an appeal of a director's approval of an AT&T Ojai wireless facility conditional use permit. And, then, and that's located at 511 Fairview Road. And then on February 17th, we also have another appeal of a director's approval of the Carbon California Basenberg lease modified conditional use permit to authorize continued operation and maintenance of the existing oil and gas facility for an additional 20 year period. This is located north of the city of Fillmore. So that's on February 17th. And then for March, we do have um, uh, several items on both hearing dates. So for March 3rd, we have an appeal of a planning director's approval of a coastal plan development for the redevelopment of a gas station in the community of La Conchita. That's located at 6905 Surfside Street, La Conchita. And on that same day, we will also hear a coastal CUP to redevelop the Channel Islands Community Services District administration and operations facility. That is located at 353 Santa Monica Drive in the Hollywood Beach area. And then on March 17th, we also have two items. There'll be a general plan amendment to change the general plan zoning designation and area plan designation to open space and to process a tentative parcel map to combine four lots into one larger lot. This is uh, known as the Turtle Conservancy Project, and it is in Ahoa High, 1802 McNeil Road and 4205 Thatcher Road. And then we will hear an appeal to a site plan adjustment for the exterior modifications 
to repair a driveway and remove and replace an existing fence. This is located at 8120 Cuesta del Sol um, in the north part of our coastal area. And so that's what I have to report out to you today. Thank you. Any questions of Director Ward? I have a real quick one, I hope. <laughs> uh, Director Ward, do you have any idea when the liquid waste facility in Santa Paula is going to come up? No, um, this is, I think, the Renew project you're asking about. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that project is in the environmental review, environmental review phase. We received substantial amount of public comment on the circulated mitigated negative declaration and staff, including other agencies involved in our development review process at the county are reviewing all those comments. And we are working through those during the month of January and probably the first part of February. So we don't know yet when this will be scheduled for hearing. There's a lot of comments to consider about that project. Yeah, that's what I figured. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping it doesn't come up until we can have uh, someplace big enough to hold everybody. <laughs> uh, any other comments? Hearing none, seeing none, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all.